I hereby call to order the November 7th meeting of the City of West Sacramento uh, City Council Redevelopment Successor Agency and Finance Authority. Uh, we're going to begin our meeting this evening with the Pledge of Allegiance and would like to invite our guests to join the council and the staff to engage in the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led by our representatives from the Mercy Coalition. Thank you. <coughs> the City Council met in closed session this evening, and there, uh, where we discussed uh, and conferenced matters with legal counsel. Uh, one of those matters was a discussion of existing litigation, which is the City of West Sacramento versus Brinsfield, and that's case number CV19 1202. In addition, we discussed a matter of substantial exposure to litigation, specifically Scott Rafferty letter that was dated on October 10th, 2018. And finally, we discussed the approval to initiate or intervene in an action and no further action was taken. And that brings us to item 1A, which is presentations by the public on matters not on the agenda, but within the jurisdiction of this council. Uh, we do that, ask that anyone wishing to speak to the council on this or any other item this evening to please fill out this yellow speaker card, which are located along the left side wall here. Uh, please fill out the card and return it to the clerk uh, who is located to my right. In front of the clerk, there's a timer to ensure that everyone has a chance to be heard. So everyone will get an equal amount of time, specifically three minutes. We ask that everybody respect that uh, three minutes. Um, so that way it's, uh, it's fair uh, for everyone. Also in front of the clerk is an analog flip chart which indicates which agenda item the council is currently considering and that's significant because we accept these request to speak cards up to the conclusion of the reading of the staff report. So make sure you get that in uh, before the conclusion. Finally, once a staff report has been read and the council questions and public testimony have begun, we do not accept any more speaker requests on that particular agenda item. So if you wish to speak, grab one of those cards and fill it out, please. If you're addressing a specific agenda item, please turn in your cards as soon as possible, but definitely before the conclusion. We also recognize that for some folks speaking in public uh, can cause anxiety, uh, nervousness, uh, other uh, physical responses. So we request that there'll be no boos or cat calls or cheers as we try to maintain a civil discourse in these chambers. With that, I have a few uh, requests to speak cards, and I'm going to start here with a Barbara Allen Brecker. Thank you. Please approach the podium. Hi, uh, my name is Barbara Allen Brescher, as you noted, and I'm a member of Washington Commons Co-Housing. Um, Washington Commons was founded by local people with a desire to create a home with a strong sense of community and a focus in uh, a sustainable uh, focus and excuse me I'm sorry and a focus on sustainable living in a walkable neighborhood as you know uh, the neighborhood is the Washington neighborhood here in West Sacramento where we now own the property and plan to build our future home I'm here to share some very exciting news with you about the progress of our project so I, I think this is not controversial and <laughs> a, a nice easy way to start the meeting uh, this coming Monday, on November 11th, Washington Commons is hosting a design reception at La Crosta Pizza Bar from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m., where we will reveal uh, design plans for our four-story, 35-unit condominium building, uh, which are being submitted to the City of West Sacramento for your review. Our community includes over 6,000 square feet of common amenities with a great room overlooking an outdoor terrace, a lounge, a workshop, exercise room, and a community room. Jorn Bass of Urban Development and Partners out of Portland, Oregon, heads our professional team that includes Malum Architects and MFA Architects also of Portland. Katie McCammont, 
nationally renowned co-housing consultant is also a part of our team. Both Jorn and Katie will be at the reception to talk about our plans and answer any questions. Please take a look at our website, washington-commons.org, for more information, including contact information. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to speak today. And I would also like to add that we are very excited about becoming your neighbors. And we hope you can make it to our reception on Monday. And you should, uh, should have received a handout as well. That is our flyer uh, talking about our our um, project and uh, information about the event on Monday. Thanks Thank for, again. Thank you very much. I have an additional speaker card from Danny Langford. Good evening. Good evening. So I just wanted to, to mention, I was at the I Street Bridge um, open house, whatever you want to call it, over in Old Sac. I want to say I was a little disappointed that we had no representatives there from West Sac. And seeing Russ Liebig there, planning commissioner, it would have been nice for even him to get up to the microphone to represent us. Because honestly, I don't think I heard West Sacramento mentioned more than three times that whole time during their presentation which makes me pretty sad because we're a 50-50 situation. A um, few things that were concerning, of course, the through one would be my choice because it's not only the least expensive, but it seems like it'd be the least to maintain. I do have concerns about the through two because with the copper that they're talking about being on the towers, how will that drainage or fall off, what will that affect the river with that copper dripping on a rainy day. Does that make sense, dripping into the river? And copper is very hard to keep clean. <laughs> and on the wood renderings, I'm wondering if it's going to be the um, prefabbed wood, like what they're using to replace the boardwalk in Old Sac, because of course that would be less expensive and less maintenance to keep up on. That was never mentioned and no one could answer that question when I asked it. Also, um, I am really concerned about there being so much focus on an outlook for pedestrians and a seating place for pedestrians, when frankly the I Street Bridge, that's what that whole top level is supposed to be for, biking, pedestrians, park-like, right? And in all the renderings they showed, none of course were towards our side of the river, they were all towards the Sacramento skyline. and yet none of them showed the current I Street Bridge in any of those renderings, which if you're looking from that bridge to the skyline, that black bridge is gonna be right there. I Street Bridge is gonna be right there in front of it. So why are those not in the renderings? It makes it real glossy, but let's be real about it. Um, and the through one actually would have the most character of what the bridges that are already there without being too outdated and two Jetson-like, for those of you that remember the Jetsons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> also, who's gonna pay for the lights at night? They're beautiful, but they were to we were told that there will not be solar for that. Who's gonna pay for that? Who's gonna pay for the maintenance on the bridge? Who's gonna pay for the person that's gonna sit there and lift the bridge when it needs to go up and down for the, the boats to go through? Also, I think there needs to be four lanes, not three. We need two going out of this community and two coming into this community. If we're paying half of the, of the bridge cost, why are we not getting two, two lanes each way? And with that, I have to end. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Langford. Our next speaker is Zane Hatfield. Good evening, Council. Zane Hatfield, uh, Director of Programs for Yolo Food Bank. First, some great news. In addition to Tony's fine foods, we have now picked up the following additional large food donor accounts in the last two weeks in West Sacramento, and those include Cormark International, NorCal Produce, and La Tortilla. Combined, these pickups will amount to one to two million additional pounds of rescued food per year with an in-kind donation value of two to $3.6 million per year. These donations were previously leaving West Sacramento and leaving Yolo County. 
Through Yolo Food Bank's work, we have retained these donors to feed the most vulnerable communities in West Sacramento. Secondly, to pick, off, to pick up where Michael left off at the last city council meeting, from the studies in this familiar blue folder, it is detailed that 31% of food available for human consumption in the United States is sent to landfill. Even more is tilled under, under agricultural fields instead of being harvested and distributed. Rescuing this wasted food is a quadruple win. It's, a good, it's good for the economy, it's good for our community, it's good for the environment, and importantly, it's good for our vulnerable neighbors. However, are you aware that the state legislation adopted uh, a bill in 2016 that will soon mandate that West Sacramento develop and implement an edible food recovery program or face state fines of up to $10,000 per day? By January 1st, 2020, West Sacramento will be required under Senate Bill 1383 to increase commercial edible food generators access to edible food recovery organizations like Yolo Food Bank, increase edible food recovery capacity, including funding, and engage in public education and outreach and monitoring enforcement. Other than Yolo Food Bank, there is no viable SB 1383 compliant edible food recovery partner in Yolo County with which jurisdiction can partner to meet SB 1383 requirements. All such entities outside of Yolo County are prohibited from operating within our exclusive service area due to Feeding America regulations. There is no better time than now to make your food rescue and waste diversion plan. In addition, why not begin the implementation as well? After all, poverty and food insecurity does not start on January 1st, 2020 or 2022. It is all around us right now. Thank you. Thank you for that update. It's great news. Um, we have another speaker card for, is it Kazi Shukis? <coughs> Thank you, sir. Hey, tell me how, how I was to Kaziz. Kaziz. It's a Lithuanian name. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm here to, for two reasons. One is to thank, uh, let you know that I had a very good interaction with the uh, flood uh, commissioner, uh, Bob, I think uh, Greg Thauburn and his team over the last several months. I uh, had a concern, my community, I'm the president of the HOA of Riva on the River, which is about 50 yards from the levee there, had a concern about that. and. Uh, after several meetings, I think we're on the same page now as to what that concern was, and I just want to share that they were very receptive in that regard. Uh, one other thing that was, I made an observation of, the BOSC, Board of Senior Consultants, is going to meet next month. They're the group that approved in 2010 the levy project. They were kind of called in, from what I understand, by the city to look over the levy EIP and see, yep, this is the way to go. And now they're back to kind of say, at least the section that pertains to where I am, that they're gonna, as Greg said, they're the quality guys. After the contract's done, they're gonna come do the quality work. But what I was surprised to find out is that it's not open to the public. It's a meeting, it has an agenda, but it's, again, not open to the public. Uh, the first meeting in 2010 was open to the public for comment and things of that nature. So I'd like to have you take a look at that, if you will, and see what the restrictions are to the public at that meeting, either for comments or physically being at the site. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shukis. <clears throat> and uh, there are no further requests to speak under item 1A. Uh, so with that, we're going to proceed to item 1B. Uh, council communications. Are there any council communications? Council Member Guerrero? Yes. Um, just re, um, reporting out that um, last week, uh, sorry, this Monday, um, the League of Cities Sacramento Valley Division convened and the board selected the following locations for quarterly division meetings in 2020. Um, Redding in Region 1, Grass Valley in Region 2, and Rockland in Region 3. And um, after additional discussion, Region 2 meeting may possibly be held in Paradise if the City PAC event is then held in Grass Valley. And uh, we are, the League is also looking for proposals for the next rural working group for webinars and uh, mayors and city council members executive forum. And last Monday, the League of Cities and the California State Association of Counties held a homelessness policy workshop. 
and Grass Valley Council Member Jan Arbuckle and Yola County Supervisor Oscar Biegos, co-chairs of the 2018 Homelessness Task Force, refreshed everyone's memory about the Institute for Local Governments Task Force Joint Cities and Counties Homelessness Report and highlighted how critical it is for cities and counties and the state to collaborate on programs that help people living on the streets or those vulnerable um, to homelessness. And the Homeless Coordinating and Financing Council, Representative Lahia Matox, um, provided background on their role working with local government. And she reminded everyone of last week's announcement of the Homeless Housing Assistance um, Program and Prevention Program funding availability, which was, uh, is posted on their website. HAP is program is a block grant program designed to provide jurisdictions with one-time grant funds to support regional coordination and expand or develop local capacity to address their immediate coordination and homelessness challenges. She mentioned spending must be informed by best practices framework used on moving homelessness individuals and families into uh, permanent housing. In addition, I wanted to um, bring to your attention the San Bernardino Innovative and Regional Programs um, panel that um, referenced that the one initiative uh, they uh, are looking at, are doing, and I would like to explore further in our strategic planning session, um, is the rehab of motels um, to house um, individuals that are unsheltered. They learned that it is quicker, affordable, and communities are often more receptive to supportive housing in a rehabbed um, motel rather than looking at old, older dilapidated motels. And the cost ratio shows that you can get two to three units for one, one new unit would cost. Um, also, um, Secretary um, of Health and Human Services, Dr. Galley, and Supervisor Mark Reilly Thomas, and our Sacramento Mayor, um, Daryl Steinberg, um, explained their role about the Governor's Council of Regional Homelessness Advisors, which is to look at how to end street-based homelessness. They shared best practices to, uh, and shared best practices to get homeless people treatment and services and explore how to build enough affordable housing. Um, Supervisor Ridley Thomas brought to our attention um, the Los Angeles County's mortality rate study. And the number of deaths have soared from 536 to 1,047. And the death rate, which accounts for increases in the homeless population, also increased in that time period by more than one-third. And the report found uh, that people are, in fact, dying at a higher rate because they're homeless. Um, Dr. Barbara Ferrer, Director of Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, um, highlighted that the leading cause of death is drug and alcohol overdoses and other, um, other health issues like heart disease um, and uh, transportation-related injuries and homicides, um, among others. And so I'm interested in exploring this um, in our community as well because those um, type of situations do put a strain in our first responders. And so looking at what we can do to be more preventive um, is something I, I wanna find out and explore further. Um, on October 9th, I joined Mayor Cabald, Mayors Cabaldin and Steinberg and um, Councilmember Ledesma and um, the Climate Change Summit for students. And I'm sure um, uh, Councilmember Ledesma will bring some more, uh, add some more information about that. It was very um, insightful to hear over the 100 students that were there about their interest in climate change. So it was a real exciting event. And I also joined the mayor at the Regional Futures Forum where the mayor shared um, the success of VIA and the collaboration among our partners, transportation districts, um, that gave our region an opportunity to ex exchange ideas on improving trans uh, transportation op options. Last week, I also had the chance to tour the Reclamation District's 900 uh, operations and was very impressed with the amount of work they do on a shoestring budget. I'm looking forward to working with Tim, the new executive director there. Um, earlier today, I visited with coffee um, with the COP at the community center. Very well done, and I want to express my appreciation for um, the work that West Sacramento PD does to do outreach with our residents. And last Saturday, West Sacramento received um, the grand opening of a new Sacramento Regional Fire Museum. Um, they are a significant um, added value to our community in educating our youth on fire safety promoting careers of firefighting and giving our local schools a venue to tour the rich firefighting history in our region. So I'm very appreciative to have them in, in our city. That concludes my report. Thank you, Councilmember Guerrero, and I agree. Uh, the, the matters that you raised uh, definitely do put a, a large strain on several different agencies, including our criminal justice system. So I'd be interested in, in following up with you on Thank that. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilmember Ledesma. Uh, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, a few things uh, to go over tonight. Uh, first, I'll start with uh, what Council Member Guerrero brought up, which is the uh, Climate Change Youth Summit that was held um, on the 19th. And thank you uh, for being there uh, as a member of the Climate 
commission. Uh, it was, I was proud to be able to host that event. Over 100 students did show up um, along um, with uh, uh, America Baldwin was there, Mayor Steinberger was there from Sacramento. Uh, but I really want to thank uh, the staff and the staff at River City High School as well as at uh, Washington Unified for pulling that off. Um, it was really well done and we had over 100 students from all over the region uh, that came to that, very interested in climate change and giving their voice to that important topic. So uh, thanks to our friends at River City and at, um, at Washington Unified, appreciated that. And it was a really great uh, summit, lots of enthusiasm. So thank you. Um, and all that feedback um, um, is, is, will be presented back to uh, the Climate Commission um, at our, I think I believe our March uh, or January meeting. Um, on the 17th, uh, I did uh, participate on, with SAFCA meeting as the alternate. Uh, I was there, so uh, sir, I know you attended that meeting and uh, brought your concerns up to staff, so I'm glad to hear that uh, you're able to resolve that with Greg uh, Fabin and others on uh, the, your concerns uh, around the Riva district, so thank you. Uh, but also at that meeting, uh, we appointed Greg Fabin uh, to the general manager position, uh, interim general manager, so congratulations, Greg. Uh, as we continue to work on uh, uh, flood issues uh, for SAFCA. They're doing a terrific job. Um, so th thank you um, um, to Greg on that work. On uh, October 21st, uh, as part of the Yolo County Transportation District, we the board held a strategic visioning session. Uh, this was part of the strategy as chair, really trying to work with the rest of the board from across Yolo County uh, to set some priorities and vision for the district. Uh, with all the changes in mobility and transit uh, going on across the country, it's, it's impacting us. Uh, YCDD has a pretty important role in servicing uh, communities like our, which is ours, which is the more urban areas, as well as our communities in Woodland and Winters, which may be in the more rural areas. Um, and it was a good opportunity for all the board members that came, including uh, Council Member Sandine, because we invited alternates to come, uh, get some feedback and thoughts on the direction that board should be going. Uh, some similar themes that we had are around uh, uh, being more efficient uh, with the bus service, with the transit service, what we have today, uh, looking ahead at how we can how we can streamline routes, be more uh, have more uh, frequency of routes. Uh, those types of things are important to us as well as being a, a better collaborator in the region. Uh, that was one of the things that we all it was a kind of a universal theme and how we can better. Um, uh, collaborate with other transit districts in our neighboring cities. And that just that doesn't mean uh, regional transit, that's their, uh, one of them, but also with Unitrans in, um, in Davis, uh, as well as with the Solano County District, uh, which is that's a high frequency destination for our friends in winters. Uh, so again, very enlightening for us. And um, so the result of that is uh, we're starting to put together uh, through the facilitator, which was our uh, folks from Yellow County, uh, help facilitate this. We'll be putting together vision uh, statements and priorities and uh, possible projects as a way to chart the next year with the Yellow County Transit District um, and creating priorities then at the operational level, especially as we are coming back. As you, we, we heard a presentation the last meeting, I think it was, on the comprehensive operational analysis where they're doing in-depth studies and, and on ridership and routes throughout the city. So this will give us a really good lens to look at that data and be able to prioritize those routes. So uh, we'll be meeting again on October, I'm sorry, November 18th, a special meeting. We'll finish some of the work here, but also start getting more details on the comprehensive operational analysis. So it was a really good session. I wanna thank uh, YCTD um, staff and also I know Sarah uh, contributed to that, Sarah Strand from our staff. So um, I'm preparing for that. So thank you very much. It was a really good, good, good session. Uh, on October 23rd, back to the Climate Commission, uh, we actually did have a meeting of the uh, uh, Mayor's uh, Commission on Climate Change, which I'm a member along with uh, from Sacramento, uh, Council Member Hansen. But there, um, again, I wanna thank David Tilley who came and gave an update on the good work that we're doing in West Sacramento. We're getting ready to start uh, revisiting the Climate Action Plan, which we approved at the last council meeting. So David, I don't know if you're in the audience, where there you are. Thank you for coming, showing up and staffing that again, good work. And Sarah was also there uh, because the topic of the night, we had a land use issue, uh, but we also took on a mobility issue where the process is um, a lot of folks in the technical areas uh, meet uh, prior to these meetings to come up with recommendations and, and, um, and uh, possible implementation actions. 
that both cities can aspire to. And uh, so the tax did come back. Uh, they had three areas of, of focus around active transportation, which has to have everything to do with uh, walkability and, and bikeability across your cities. That was a priority. Transit and shared mobility to leverage things that we're already doing, like we heard about in VIA. Um, um, that's, an, that's an example of things that are going right. Uh, we also had a, uh, they also had a, uh, a recommendation around zero emission uh, vehicles and the utilities around that and infrastructure. So uh, I, uh, the commission is really important for us. We're doing a lot of things right, and this is gonna come back with some challenges for us um, on how we view mobility uh, beyond what we're doing today, especially as it relates to land use and how we look at um, uh, 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 vehicle trips that are taken um, and how we can increase transit opportunities for our residents. That's gonna be a challenge for us. Um, I know everybody experiences traffic already, and those, especially those coming out of Southport. Um, we're gonna have to really work on this, not just for climate change, but to make it more convenient for us. It's a priority and the commission is really good for that because it, for us, at least where I'm advocating for, is to get that commission to really back some of the things where we want to do, whether it's, uh, as we talked about, uh, the article this week came out uh, around the possible light rail into West Sacramento and other transit opportunities, having that body's endorsement as a way to kind of further that, super important. So again, we're, I'm furthering that notion. The other area that I brought up to the commission, I thought you'd be interested in because we took this up as well at the last meeting as uh, we went into the agreement with the Valley Clean Energy um, uh, Coal, um, was it Association, was it someone, whatever, yeah. Board. Yeah, Valley Clean Energy, yeah, whatever. But it was our way to kind of start looking at alternatives to our current energy provider um, and ways that we can uh, further that. And it's clear in the Climate Con Commission uh, discussions, um, and I brought this up very uh, uh, emphatically to the board, that I want this as part of their recommendation, is that to achieve climate change and to achieve even some of the uh, things we want to do with transit and, and, and uh, electrification of, of vehicles, they have a distinct advantage to reach those goals, it's, and, it's, and their name is SMUD. They're a great partner in their community in furthering those things. And our current energy provider, uh, PG&E, is not in that same realm of being a partner in the community towards those goals. And I asked the board to consider, start considering a recommendation from that board about possible um, endorsement of a, looking at how, how SMUD or some other altern energy alternative to back that initiative. It's, as our residents know, I know as a resident, our businesses know, uh, energy on our side of the river is on average about 25, 30% higher, if I talk to business owners, than it is across the river. Uh, add that to the fact that uh, the incentives and rebates and things that SMUD is doing to try to further clean energy, solar energy, um, are a probably our step beyond what we can get from PG&E. So again, this commission is, is turning out to be an important vehicle for us to get across some other priorities for us and I'll continue using it um, and because we're already doing, I'm confident, the things we're already doing on climate uh, change and the mitigating the risks of that. Uh, there's a nexus there between the things we're also trying to achieve in transit and in energy that I think could be useful. So again, these are, and the, and the board members are starting to agree with that. So again, really good um, meeting of the Climate Commission. Uh, we'll be meeting again in a few weeks uh, to follow up on some of these items, but again, just wanna make sure you're aware of those issues going on at that commission. Uh, finally, I know because I know got brought up in um, in um, the opening remarks. I'm sorry, the, the uh, general statements uh, from Danny Langford. Uh, I Street Bridge replacement tomorrow. I'll be at uh, my role in this is to be at actually a voting member of the pan voting panel, which I'll be meeting tomorrow with the selection committee, where we receive the feedback from the public because uh, that was one of the issues is that um, you brought up the workshops are there for the public to get their impressions. We start getting that information back. Uh, so we can start helping shape the decision making around that. Uh, there is still, I believe, is Jason here? Uh, Jason McCoy, I think the online, there's still opportunity to weigh in on the, on the um, bridge selection, I think online. So I'll, I'll verify that because I think we're still taking that. Uh, so there's still opportunity to get your feedback in on the bridge selection. So uh, it is a really exciting part, you don't, uh, thing to do. You don't get, not very often you get to build a bridge in your city. Um, so if you have feedback, there's some really good design uh, that are started. Um, so again, there's, I think there's still opportunity to provide that feedback, but we, it's winding up soon. 
uh, we're going to have to make a decision here soon. And uh, I think we're planning uh, to announce the decision at the beginning of the year. So again, just kind of pay attention to that. Um, but that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Ledezma. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> On November 1st, I met or I attended uh, CalWORKs Housing for Homeless Families. Uh, a project that was made possible by a partnership between Yolo County HHSA, Yolo County Housing, and a private property owner. Uh, specifically, is a, a, a complex on Merkley Avenue that had fallen into disrepair and became a nuisance property. There was a, a private uh, a family that invested in the property and uh, refurbished it and renovated it. And uh, as of last Friday, we're uh, about to fill those units with people who struggled with homelessness and are at the cusp of, of permanent, uh, uh, being permanently unsheltered. That said, they now have a place to live. And um, it was really exciting to, to see the, the project. Um, speaking about best practices, uh, Council Member Guerrero, I think that this model could be one of those that we would consider in the future uh, when looking at um, potential for uh, housing folks that are housing insecure. And I just really want to recognize uh, someone who was um, instrumental in this project, and that's, he's looking away right now, but that's Mark Sawyer. Uh, Mr. Sawyer, will you stand up, please? He doesn't like anything like this. Let's give it up for Mark Sawyer. For those of you who have not yet met Mark Sawyer, uh, he is our homeless coordinator. He's been with our city for quite some time now and has made a tremendous impact through his position by being one of the most informative and most active people in this community, if not the most, on matters involving homeless the homeless in our community. Um, with that, he uh, what happened to be at the right place at the right time. He recognizes as a nuisance property. And one day, when the owners came to pay a visit, he approached them and, and asked them if they would be considered being a partner in this effort. Uh, lucky for us, they were amenable. And now lucky for everyone, we have another option for people in our community who otherwise wouldn't find uh, shelter. Um, so thank you, Mark. And, and again, thank you to all the folks that you work with, too. I know Mark is instrumental in working with uh, several different organizations, many of whom are here tonight, uh, in addressing some of the most pressing needs when it comes to our homeless community. In addition, uh, on um, Thursday, what, uh, last Thursday, uh, our uh, downtown streets team program uh, was paid a visit by a group of 15. And this group of 15 included uh, the uh, city council member, Nolan Sullivan, who brought uh, housing director Emily Cantu, his police captain, uh, Ian Schmoltzler, uh, police lieutenant David Callis, and representatives from Kaiser and other agencies. Uh, these were employees of Vacaville, Solano County, uh, and other agencies who visited the city of West Sacramento to view and observe its uh, best practices, specifically our downtown streets team model. Uh, Councilmember Sullivan is considering bringing that model to Vacaville and brought them all to West Sacramento to see how it's really done. Um, Tremendous feedback from the community still about our program here. Uh, both uh, Mark Sawyer and the Downtown Streets team are funded by, funded by Measure E, which was passed by our voters in 2016. So that is a direct report as to and feedback as to where our tax dollars are going in the area of uh, uh, reducing the impacts and incidences of homelessness in West Sacramento. And with that, uh, that concludes Council Communications. I'm going to move to item 1C. Uh, there actually are appointments today. So Mayor Cabaldon reached out to me and submitted the following assignments and appointments for City Council consideration and confirmation for tonight's meeting. Uh, specifically, Public Financing Authority, which is the Enhanced Infrastructure Financing District. His appointments are Chris Ledesma, Council Member Chris Ledesma, uh, Mayor Christopher Cabaldon, Council Member Beverly Sandine, and uh, Civilian Russ Liebig. In addition, for the Board of Directors for Valley Clean Energy Alliance, Christopher Cabaldon, Beverly Sandine, and Chris Ledesma as an alternate. And for the Board of Directors for Yolo Emergency Communications Agency, uh, our incoming Fire Chief, uh, uh, Steve Bins, 
as well as Aaron Laurel, our city manager. So with that, I need to entertain a motion, if there is one, please, for uh, the civilian members, including Russ Liebig to the Public Financing Authority, as well as Steve Vins and Aaron Laurel to the Board of Directors for the YOLO Emergency Communications Agency. Can I have a motion? Uh, I'll move the recommended action. Is there a second? Second. Uh, the motion was made by Council Member Ledesma and seconded by Council Member uh, Guerrero. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, uh, any opposed? Motion carries and those appointments are made. <clears throat> We're gonna now move to the consent agenda. And those are items two through 22. So we have quite a few things on the consent agenda. At this juncture uh, with the council's approval, I'd like to remove item 11 since I have a variety of speaker cards on that item and perhaps we could take that separate and apart and move through the regular consent agenda. I have um, some items I would like to remove from the consent agenda. You um, want them removed from the calendar, or do you want to uh, just ask questions about them? I have questions, and yeah, in item 11, I do have to um, remove that in, as okay. well. Um, That's fine. I'm not sure where I'm going to land on that one yet. Okay. So, the, so the ask is to consider item 11 as a, almost a regular agenda item. Correct. And then right. ask questions, and we usually don't consent. I'm yes. fine with that. So, yes, okay. okay. And, so the, and so the other items I do have questions on. Fantastic. Okay, great. Well, I have, um, which items would you like to... Consider. Two, four, six, 17, 19, and 20. Thank you. She got mine. Okay. All of the same? Yep. Six. You uh, have six as well? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else? All right, we're going to move to item two, which is consideration of approval of a contract amendment with Chandler Asset Management Incorporated for investment management services and adoption of resolution 19-105, amending the city's adopted budget for fiscal year 19 and 20. And I do have a speaker card on this uh, from Danny Lankford. <clears throat> did, you, did you have questions or did you want Ms. Uh, Lankford to give her a comment first? I, um, no, why don't Ms. Langford come up and provide her question? First. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, she Roberta. May, she may have the same question I have. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Langford. Welcome back. So I just have a few questions. By extending this contract for thirty-six thousand, which makes it twelve thousand a month, does that mean we'll be paying one hundred and forty-four thousand for the entire year? And are we having enough return on our investment for that to make sense to spend that much money? Um, let me get track here. Should we be looking at shorter term versus longer term investments for the liquidity access if nothing else and to avoid penalties if we have to use the money sooner? And if we have that much money to invest such a big portfolio, why are we not spending it on things to fix? potholes from one end of our town to another to help with more homeless issues and help in other areas that our community so desperately needs. Yes, I understand that some of the money's already designated, like a huge chunk for the streetcar, that um, can't be used unless it's redelegated, but those are some of my questions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. Langford. Uh, Council Member Guerrero? And um, just the question about the additional funding, kind of similar to what um, Ms. Langford was asking, the need for the additional funding. Thank you. Thank you. Roberta sure. Raper. Well, I'd love to address those. Um, one, the question about, seems very loud, uh, the 12,000 a month, and does that mean 144,000 a year? Not necessarily. Um, this is a, <clears throat> excuse me, a shorter term contract while we do an RFP um, for, it, well, we did an RFP, we've got responses, we're reviewing those and we'll come back. Um, longer term contracts typically have lower rates um, and the firm that we're using now has actually proposed um, a, a, a credit on some of what we've been paying if we enter into a longer term contract as well as the other, the other um, firms that have uh, responded. Um, as far as return on investment, it's too early to tell at this point, but the goal is, I mean, we found, if you've read through the uh, report, the treasurer's report, um, that is also on this, uh, the consent agenda and also pulled, um, 
There's been a lot of work over the last couple months to evaluate and update our investment policy, um, to develop investment strategies for the different types of funds that we have um, for longer term returns. Um, so it's a little bit too soon to tell. We hired this firm, they started working um, with us to, to update the policy in July. Um, we did the strategy in August, they started investing in September. And so with the, the quarterly report that just ended, that includes one month. Um, I do have the investment manager here who can provide a little bit more information on that as well as the uh, third question Ms. Langford had about short term versus longer term and why we're um, looking at that type of a strategy. Um, I will though address why we're not spending that money on some of these other things. Um, our investment portfolio is made up of funds from all of the city's funds. Many of those are restricted. Um, we've got reserve funds in there that are held for specific purposes. We've got development impact fee funds that are held for projects until we amass enough funds to be able to, to uh, implement those projects. Those can't be spent necessarily on those types of activities. There's also water and sewer, which of course we can't spend on those. They have to be held for uh, those particular um, uh, reasons. So we, um, it, it's not that there's a lot of money just sitting around that we're stockpiling and not using for the important services. Um, it's that we have to maintain these things separately for legally restricted reasons. So um, with that, I'd love to invite our uh, investment manager up to respond to the uh, questions about return on investment and the short term versus longer term. Good evening, council members, and thank you for having me. I'd just like to address some of the questions that were addressed. Um, there was a question regarding longer term versus shorter term. The investments that you're allowed to have are governed by California uh, government code. And that list of investments that you're allowed to have is very limited. And basically, you are an investor in the bond markets, and you're limited to investments out to five years. Um, if you observe returns in the bond markets, generally speaking, the longer your duration target, the longer your average maturity is over long-term periods, the higher the returns tend to be. Of course, that comes with a little bit of added volatility, and it's a matter of balancing those things out uh, in an appropriate manner that fits the financial goals of the city. So to that effect, uh, when we stepped in, the portfolio, because of staffing reasons and various other uh, reasons, the portfolio had been getting shorter in its average maturity. And as a result, uh, as interest rates have been falling in the markets, mm -hmm. the returns for those investments have been uh, diminishing. So part of our goal was to identify an investment strategy with a longer duration target uh, and now build the portfolio to up to that target gradually. And that's the process that we've been involved with in the last month. Thank you. Very helpful. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to add one more thing, can I? Um, just one more thing, and this, this kind of ties into the uh, treasurer's report that comes up later. We've also identified a lot of funds that were sitting really idle in LAIF in very, very short term, like overnight things, right. where we were getting a 2% return um, or less. So uh, by being able to take a lot of those funds that were just sitting idle and not really working for us and putting mm -hmm. them into our investment portfolio and some of these longer term um, as bonds and securities, uh, we're actually, we should actually see um, a better return because our money's working for us versus just sitting there. So. so so that was going to be my question in number four, is the transfer from June to September, it looked significantly smaller under LAIF. That's significantly cool. smaller under LAIF, and overall smaller when we include the LAIF, uh, just because this time of year from about July to December or January when we receive our first property act property tax installment, um, and when we start receiving the current year, like sales tax um, and larger revenues, we tend to use a lot more of our funds uh, during the first six months of the year, and then they're recuperated through when we start receiving those revenues. So that's part of the, the reduction. The other part is that we took a large chunk and started investing it into our uh, portfolio so that money's working for us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're now going to segue into the con uh, item number four, consideration of the treasurer's quarterly financial report on the city's and just one more question. Oh. Okay, that's okay. fine. Um, and thank you very much because you did mention there was a, um, a return in our investment there. Uh, and what what does that look like? What how do, how does that materialize? You know, coming back to us, I see a significant amount of money in there. And so, moving forward, what are you anticipating? What are you expecting from that? 
Um, well, that's hard to say because a lot of it depends on the market. This is where okay. I'd probably bring Carlos back up. Um, but having our money managed more actively, um, one of the changes that we made in our uh, investment policy was uh, to eliminate the language to hold to maturity. What we were doing was buying CDs and things like that and just holding them to maturity where sometimes there are opportunities if somebody's watching it on a regular basis to um, sell, maybe lose a little bit on that to make a larger return on another um, another investment. And so having somebody actively manage that, we weren't actively managing it um, in the past and, and really looking at our policy and our strategy and, and, and doing better for that, we expect to see that our, we'll see higher returns. It's really too early to tell, but I'll be updating in the quarterly um, reports that we provide uh, as we go forward. Um, but a lot of it is also dependent upon the market, right, and, and how, how things go there. But I think that we can expect to see um, better returns than we were over a, lo a long period of time than we were previously because we essentially just had our money in a savings account yeah so. okay thank you yes. okay now we'll segue to item number four which is consideration of the treasurer's quarterly financial report on the city's investment portfolio for the period ending September 30th 2019 I think we just, I think we, just did that. we just got we, got, we did two okay two well I have a before. speaker I have a speaker card uh, for item number four Danny uh, Langford did you want to continue to okay please address the council I see in the investment portfolio that we're holding funds for Yolo Sac Port District, West Sacramento Area Flood Control Agency. Is this where the RD900 money is going to be going when you take it over? Isn't that commingling of funds? How will the profits off these investments be earmarked for each in entity? Or will the city maintain the profits from those investments? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Raper. Okay, so uh, we maintain funds for a lot of different individual funds within the city, as well as for other agencies that, where I act as treasurer for those agencies. Um, whether it's another agency or another fund, we use fund accounting, we keep all of those funds separate. They are pooled for investment purposes, but because we maintain our funds separately, we know our average daily cash balance, we allocate the investment earnings based on that average daily cash balance. Um, the funds for funds earned and funds invested for the port for with SAFEGA and any other agencies um, are not at risk at being commingled with the city. Nor are the funds and in individual funds that are restricted that the city holds are, are not at risk um, of being commingled with the general fund or something else. Um, those are part of our accounting requirements. Um, we have requirements to report all of this. Um, it's included in our, in our CAFR, our, our annual financial statements, and audited uh, by our independent auditors. So that is not a risk. Um, as far as whether uh, we will start managing funds for RD900, that is yet unknown. I mean, at this point, the uh, I think the, the issue on the table is the change in the governing body, um, and that is it. And so there is there is no plan at the moment for uh, us to start managing those funds. So, and if we did, same thing, they they would be kept separate. Um, they would be tracked. We would allocate things on average daily cash balance if that were to ever happen. And so there's there's no risk of commingling funds. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay. We're going to turn to item number six, which is consideration of resolution 19-97, de delegating authority to the city manager to undertake certain actions to commence and complete real property. It's okay. It's all hanging. Complete real property transactions for the Riverfront Street extension, extension and Fifth Street widening project, and adoption of. Uh, an addendum to the Bridge District Specific Plan Supplemental Environmental Impact Report. Hi. Is there public comment on this one? No. No, no it's me. Okay. It's yeah, I had a question. Uh, Council, Council Member Garrow, you have a yeah. question. Hello. Hello, LSA Tribute Senior Civil Engineer with Capital Projects and Transportation Department. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I have a question regarding um, the Caltrans. Um, studies that are going on and if there could put it's under the analysis um, these additional studies that are going on and could it by any chance um, cause any problems or preventing us from moving forward with what the recommendation here 
No, we're working in close coordination with Caltrans environmental staff, and this is the only one outstanding requirement for the project, is completion a historical resources evaluation report. So this is the last environmental document that we have to complete to comply with NEPA, and we're expecting that to happen in January of next year. So the studies would, so you know, the studies then, if you're anticipating what the outcome would be, would, would con not have any CEQA issues or anything like that as we move forward? That's correct, because the, the request was related to the former uh, Rice Mill Growers Association, which was demolished in late 1990s. Mm -hmm. So this is, an, in a sense, academic exercise for us to complete and concur with SHIPO so we can close the historical evaluation for the complex and provide sufficient paperwork for Caltrans purposes. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Yes. So, uh, thank you. I'm sorry. So, on this, um, um, thank you for the question, Council Member. Um, but this also signals, to your point, it, uh, once we get past this, signals our ability to kind of go ahead and start extending Riverfront under the freeway, and that will that precipitates our ability to get. Um, uh, I just want to flag this for the public because it'll open up. Um, uh, or attempt to widen the lane to make mm -hmm. bi more bicycle access uh, through that area. Is that a true statement? I'm making sure. We will have sufficient right of way for bicyclists and pedestrians on the Riverfront Street extension, but actually the main route for that will be designated on Fifth Street. On Fifth Street, yeah. Yes, so we, have, we will have a 10 foot bikeway separated from yeah. the roadway for public Perfect. use. Yep, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And that's really important. I mean, that's probably one of the more dangerous uh, areas as reported by the community. Isn't that correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I saw we it. have a, a very large family of bicycles that travel underneath yeah. that bridge. <laughs> so, all right. We're going to take on, uh, I believe, is there anything between, is it item number, let's see here. I think it's worth the 17. I'm going to 17. Is that yes. correct? 17. All right. Uh, we're moving to count, uh, item number 17, which is consideration of purchase of park equipment and adoption of resolution 19-107, authorizing a loan from the park impact fee fund and related budget adjustments for place structure enhancements at Heritage Oaks Park. Council Member Guerrero, do you have some questions? Yes, I, I, I've received a few questions about this particular item and, um, and you know, this is a, a, an amenity that's being added into, if you, can you provide a little bit of background so we start getting the context about this particular amenity? Absolutely. So we, we entered into um, a public-private partnership with Clutterwald um, almost two years ago now to, to develop um, some public improvements on the park site for the community in addition to the ropes course component, which will be a private component. Mm -hmm. um, as part of that, um, that a, a partnership, uh, Clutterwald is building a parking lot, a play area, um, landscaping and irrigation improvements that the entire community can use, restrooms, drinking fountain. Yeah. And then they have, as, as you may have already seen, a ropes course being constructed in the Grove of Heritage Oaks. Um, and much of that work is already completed. They've also completed over $65,000 worth of tree care work, which um, has already paid for itself with the recent storms. We didn't lose any trees or any major limbs on that park site. So, um, so what we have here is a really unique timing opportunity. This is a site that historically isn't very competitive for grants given its location. Mm. It's not considered to be in a park poor community, but the California Parks and Recreation Society in conjunction with Game Time over the past few years has offered these grant programs for steep discounts in play equipment. Um, we use this grant program for the Elkhorn neighborhood park a few years ago, and we're basically able to double the value of whatever funding you have to go towards play equipment. In this particular case, we're using all of Clutterwald's funding as part of that, that match component, and we just saw a unique opportunity to do a little bit more and take advantage of the discount in both installation and purchase price while, while we have the grant available. Mm -hmm. The performance period for the grant is that equipment must be purchased by the end of this month, and the installation must be complete by the end of March 2020. So it's a very short window, and the timing fit very nicely with this um, project, and, and it just gives us an opportunity to expand the recreation amenities. Yeah. So um, we, I don't, can't tell you exactly when the balance of the park site will be developed, 
but to be able to provide these enhanced features now, we thought was a really important opportunity to, for you to consider um, at this time. Okay, that, thank you for that background. Um, and, you know, looking at um, the, the photographs, um, I wanted to understand a little better the access to the Clitterwall um, site versus what, it, you know, the public park area. Is, is it separate? Is there's going to be a way for, you know, um, individuals to use the, um, the park structure, the, a play structure versus um, the Clitterwall um, project that is going on now, which I, I think there'll be a fee, right? Yes, exactly. Um, all of the improvements on site, um, with the exception of the ropes course, are completely accessible to the public all the time. In okay. fact, the public can actually go through the Grove of Oak Trees even while people are participating in the ropes course. Um, there will be a separate fee and training is mandatory before anybody can use the ropes course. And that, um, that is all handled separately through the office that will be constructed as part of the restroom building and can also be accommodated online. So the play equipment is available for the community all the time. Okay. And when we provide any kind of subsidy or support for any project, well, you know, it'll be an, an economic enhan enhancement to our community. Um, do you foresee any um, position where they may have a hard time being able to fulfill their obligation to complete the project and then we sub, you know, provide it alone and, and all of a sudden now we're, not in, we're in a position where it's not being completed for, for years? Well, we, we have not invested, um, we're not investing any general fund dollars into the project. Okay. We have completed street frontage improvements using both developer and lieu fees as well as some community facility district fees but um, all of the improvements that are being made are being made and funded through Clutterwald. For the enhancements that are being proposed in this agenda item, we are recommending that revenue generated from the project, which we estimate to be uh, over a million dollars over a 10-year period, about $50,000 annually in user fees, and then an annual lease payment. That revenue um, in the first year could repay the park impact fee funds that we're proposing to use for these enhancements so that we can take advantage of this opportunity at this time. Okay. I just want to be clear about that though, that this is not this is not a loan to Clutterwald or right. to anything private. This is a internal transfer of revenue that would otherwise go to our general fund that would be instead uh, put towards the park impact fees right. to replenish the amount that we're considering tonight. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Council Member Ledesma. Thank you, and, and, and Tracy, thank you for the update on this. I knew that this one might cause some confusion. It's been, you're reminding me, it's been two years since we have approved Clutterwald and, um, and, and the partnership, and I know they were delayed and, uh, um, and have found their way, but driving by there almost every day, you can see it now starting to take, take shape. And it's been a while since we've uh, looked at it and saw well, it's becoming what we asked for, which is a really public uh, public amenity uh, with a private component to it that everybody has access accessibility. You can see the, the course um, being built, actually, um, and the ropes getting uh, the platforms, like tree houses, or we call them like in the trees. It's really kind of cool to see. Um, um, so again, if, this, if anything, this was I was going to pull this just to kind of bring back that that uh, opportunity to kind of make sure that uh, people didn't know that this was a public um, uh, amenity, that this is a park. Mm -hmm. And I know that we've done this before where we've had an opportunity to take advantage of something that's going in and borrow from another fund to, from funds to get, get the really good price and get it while we had it. And with all the new housing going in there, um, it's, um, it's really cool. Now I'm gonna bring up something that I'm gonna flag for staff. I'm supportive of this, uh, this flag for staff is that uh, Lake Wash, uh, the Village Parkway, excuse me. Um, uh, uh, it, it the, the the sidewalk is great. The new sidewalk, the meandering sidewalk, that leads into the park is great. Um, but we're going to have to deal with uh, Village Parkway width and bike access. Mm -hmm. um, and it's I know I've brought this up to staff before, um, but it's just something we're going to have to figure out how to uh, as development comes or doesn't come. Um, it's being used heavily now. Um, I know some of the work that's being done by our uh, police tra and traffic committee uh, around some of the traffic impacts 
that we're seeing in general in the area. The Village Parkway is heavily used and there's a lot of traffic and people are wanting to use their bikes and they can't use bikes if uh, they don't feel safe. There's not, uh, on the northbound lane, there's no room uh, but where the park starts and, and goes. So for the somebody, one of the council members mentioned there's a family of bikes that goes around traveling all the time. There's a lot of families in that area that would, so we just need to figure out a strategy around that. I know uh, some of the mechanics behind that um, around some of the agreements that may or may not be in place, or um, but we're gonna have to figure out how to make sure Village Parkway can accommodate that. It's gonna be heavily used park. It's gonna be great, and um, but it, that's gonna be an issue. And um, just to piggyback on that, I, I you know remember two years ago when we discussed this matter, and one of the the biggest items of uh, questioning by the council was whether or not this there would be public amenities. We wanted to make sure that this community had access to everything that that part that area was zoned for, and in this case, we had a unique opportunity to have a unique uh, amenity, the the ropes course itself, uh, but also. Uh, develop the area all around it so that people pushing strollers or walking their dogs or taking a, a, a leisurely walk would have an opportunity to sit down or enjoy uh, watching kids play or you know just take a rest and read a book uh, that otherwise would not have been on the radar from my understanding because there were no immediate plans to activate that space is that correct Tracy that's correct okay so we're taking advantage of, of an opportunity to now make a play structure two to three times maybe four times better than we had originally planned at a s relatively uh, smaller investment I mean it is an augment but at the same time relative to what we're getting it is, is a larger a better investment is that correct correct and mm -hmm. and it should pay for itself in a year with revenues mm -hmm. generated from the project and it just, I mean, it goes to show, uh, uh, I've got to commend park staff because, you know, four or five years ago when we had a, a unique opportunity just like this for the Disney Kaboom Park, we moved quickly, like within months. And we have one of, the, uh, if, I think it is the largest Disney Kaboom build in the nation here in West Sacramento because of, you know, someone uh, who at the time, you know, gave me a call and said, hey, there's an opportunity and our council moved on it. Um, so the council wouldn't move on it. Uh, we couldn't have, as a community, brought it together without the ingenuity of, of the park staff and your ability to identify these opportunities for the betterment of our community. So thank you all. <clears throat> Is there any more comments or questions on this matter? I, I do have a couple Council Member Guerrero? Yes. And, um, so on, so this is not a loan, I get that. It's a loan to the general fund um, from the park impact fee. And, uh, but we are gonna get reimbursed to the general fund is what I understand. And over a period of time from the revenue that we are anticipating from that period of time that you described, is there a way to, to um, track that some, so that we can see how that's coming along? Of course, yeah. Okay. We can we can we can track that. We can report back on it. Report back. That would be great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I have a speaker card from Danny Lankford. So I think some of my questions got answered, but I wasn't quite able to hear all of it. Um, first of all, we gave them the de developer in lieu fees to do the sidewalks and the, the other infrastructure, is that correct? I know you wanna answer me right now, but maybe when I sit down, somebody can answer me. Um, if the city put that in, then why did we give them that money up front? If they put it in, great, but does that mean that the sidewalks are not gonna be put in on the other side of the street across from it or landscaping because the developer money is gone now for the in-lieu fees? Um, my concern is, will this set a precedent for other developments or companies that want to come in and do the same type of thing if we're loaning them money to do the project? I'm not against the play structure. Please don't anybody get me wrong. I'm not a ropes course person myself, and heights terrify me with little kids, but that's me. I get it. But honestly, I would not want to be a neighbor in that area because they're going to be so impacted by cars. Um, and are we leasing them the land? If so, for how much and for how long? Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Um, to address Ms. Langford's questions, 
Um, starting with the last question first, there are lease payments. Uh, the lease payments are a minimum of 10,000 a year or a percentage of their gross revenues, whichever is higher. Um, the developer in lieu fee was collected for the street frontage improvements for the park site specifically. We use those developer in lieu fees to construct the street frontage improvements. Um, I'm trying to think if I missed a question. And again, there was not a loan to Clutterwald. No loan, no project. loan to Clutterwald. What we, the the nature of the loan is that we want to make sure the park impact fees that we're using for these enhancements are made whole, and are reimbursed using the revenues from the project, so that it's very clear that the the, the PIF fund is made whole. And thank you for your work on this. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And. Moving on to item number 19. Actually, let me see. I have a speaker card for 18. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> item number 19 is consideration of a facilities license agreement with the Sacramento Valley Limited Partnership, DBA Verizon Wireless, and request for authority to amend the city's agreement with Bureau Veritas to allow for applicant funded plan check and inspection services applications from any carrier. <clears throat> uh, who pulled this item? Uh, Council Member Guerrero? Hi, John. Hi. I have, I'm excited to see that we have another carrier interested and um, looking to see how we can maximize an opportunity to improve access to the internet. Um, I feel like I have a dial-up modem from my house where I live and it barely has any, you know, we'd have to have a hotspot or something to make it, anything work in there um, through AT&T. Is there a chance this will help improve the situation? If so, how can we, how can we accomplish that? Improve the internet speed at individual homes? Yes. Um, yes, I, uh, there's a representative from Verizon here who could probably answer that in greater detail, but generally speaking, the technology that we're talking about is specifically to provide, you know, faster internet speeds for you know, various purposes, businesses and homes and whatnot. So I'm not sure about the, the timing of that or logistically how it works, but there are people here who do know that, so. So citywide is what I'm looking for. Yeah. Yes. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dante Williams. I'm with Verizon Wireless uh, Small Cell Strategy Team. I'm pleased to uh, be able to address the council. So yes, the, the, um, the small cell network that we're proposing um, is, de is, uh, is basically built uh, directly to address capacity and broadband issues. Um, there are some uh, uh, places that we want to for up, uh, shore up our 4G coverage, um, and definitely we're in the market to compete with both wireline and wireless, uh, so everything from your traditional Comcast wired service, your AT&T DSL dial-up, we want to be able to compete with those services as well as offer um, a, a complete small cell network citywide. So this is not something that'll be focused um, like your traditional network in certain areas. This is something that's actually meant to be deployed um, on a, in, in an ubiquitous way. We'd also like to work with the city to find out if there are troubled areas that we need to focus on um, that, so that our deployment model actually matches up to city's requirements. So anything outside of West Capitol Avenue is pretty, I think, pretty difficult, pretty challenging. and expedite in a timeline so that we can improve access to the internet on a better speed. Oh, that's exactly what, so that's the opportunity that we'd like okay. to take. I mean, that's, that's the whole purpose of the project and the infrastructure investment that Verizon Wireless is willing to make is to improve those speeds uh, citywide. Okay, and, and what, what is your timeline? What, how, how do we, and how do you roll that out and Communicate in, to the in this forum, because of the competitive nature of our business right now, I probably shouldn't share that in this forum uh, because oh, okay. we have competitors okay. such as AT&T, T-Mobile, and now even Dish Network is trying to get into the mobile space. Uh, but I would be pleased to sit with the city staff um, and any council member to, dis to discuss, you know, uh, deployment strategies and then focus areas, right? Because you may have a, a particular focus area we need to prioritize and, and we're able to do that uh, through our deployment method. Thank you. I've reached out to AT&T already a couple of times, so. Well, I, you have my, con I'll make sure you have my contact information directly. I'll be the point person to make sure you get those answers so that you only have to reach out one time. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Do you need additional questions? I have a speaker card from Joshua Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. 
Thank you, council members and concerned citizens for allowing me the time to speak today. Um, I greatly enjoyed the conversation that I heard earlier regarding the Climate Commission for Youth, and I was hoping to channel that in my conversation right now. Um, the small cell towers and 5G deployment that's being considered is not tested. Um, it is a brand new technology that is, uh, I mean, essentially medically not founded on any current science, and it poses a lot of issues coming forward. Um, uh, across the state, there are cities like San Francisco, Monterey, Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, and Mill Valley that are having their city council slow down and stop and consider what this is going to do. Uh, if we are so concerned about climate change and the impact that will have on our community, our children, and our fellow uh, citizens, why is it not something that's so public health oriented also given that same consideration? Um, Focus on broadband deployment is a huge issue in West Sacramento given the fact that we have two wired internet carriers that are available. The FCC, chaired by an ex-official from Verizon, is stymieing that deployment across the country and including in our own community. Deploying 5G is not the answer. It is a wireless solution to a problem that we have a solution for and can deploy. Putting ourselves and our health at risk for such technology without knowing what its implications are is irresponsible. It's putting the, or the health and safety of all of us at risk. I urge you to slow down and look at the fake cell tower trees and just imagine what it's going to be like if some of the implications of 5G on the health of everyone, the young, the old, the sick, um, if that's allowed to just run rampant, what are we going to do? Cigarettes have only been dangerous for 20 years and alcohol is just now becoming a poison. What are the public health implications and what are we going to do to slow them down? Why are we allowing Bay Area organizations and cities to do something the right way and we're used as guinea pigs. Sacramento was announced as one of the first cities in 5G and I hated it. It's dangerous. We need to stop and consider what it is that we're doing and why we're doing it. If we have other alternatives that are proven to be safe and effective, why are we not rolling them out? I urge you strongly, please, consider what it is that we're doing and why we're putting ourselves in the front line of scientific discovery. I do not want my two-year-old and seven-month-old to be underneath a 5G cell tower. There's already enough EMF that we have to consider. I shouldn't have to be putting 5G curtains on my house just to ensure that I have some kind of semblance of safety, nor should any of my concerned citizens standing behind me. I am available and would love to talk through some of these implications with you if you would like to. If you're gonna take the recommendations of industry, please listen to the recommendations of your constituents. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Uh, we're now moving to item number, is that 19? Uh, uh, item number 20, which is consideration of agreement with County of Yolo for animal control services for fiscal year 2019 and 20. Council Member Guerrero? Mm, yes, thank you. Um, just a, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so just a quick question. Um, in, in, Prior discussions, we've had um, a consideration of taking a look at whether we would work with Sacramento, um, and we have a two-year contract today. So that would I anticipate this contract is going to, you know, be held um, for the two years. Would there be any um, possibility that it could be that it could be changed or eliminated? Is there a, like something where we can move forward yeah. without this? This is actually only a one-year contract with a, a one-year contract potential okay. one-year extension. Okay, um, and there's a 30-day. Um, notice period that we are continuing to have discussions with Sacramento. So if something were to come um, to fruition with that, then um, we could always invoke, invoke the um, the 30 day. Okay. Cancellation. Thank you for letting me know about that. I have a speaker card from Bob Schabert. Mr. Schabert. Hi, welcome back. Thank you. Usually when I'm here, it's regarding Coast Guard. <laughs> uh, this is Kind of a subject that's near and dear to me. I am on the board of directors of Unleashing the Possibilities, uh, that's chaired by Judge Rosenberg. Um, we've recently did a survey throughout uh, Yellow County of all the residents. Um, West Sac was about probably about 50 percent of our turnout that we got on the survey. Um, right now, we've got the raw data. We should be releasing it to all the city uh, council members throughout Yellow County and the city managers right after the first of the year. It's got some astounding results. We actually got some very fantastic returns from the uh, residents of our uh, city here in West Sac. So anyway, I encourage us to move forward, at least temporarily. And I'd also like to encourage the uh, city of West Sacramento to participate uh, in talks for, uh, regarding the JPA. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Schaber. 
Any other further discussion or questions? Okay. Um, with that, I think that concludes the consent agenda. I would like to entertain a motion to move the consent agenda with exception of item number 11, which will be uh, taken up as a regular agenda item. I'll move the recommended action. That's second. moved by Council Member Ledesma and seconded by Council Member Guerrero. All in favor? Aye. All any opposed? With that, uh, consent calendar is moved. I'm gonna to turn to item number 11 at this juncture. This is consideration of a resolution 19-108, accepting public improvements completed to date. For parcel map four, 4,888, Southport Business Park, phase 4B, located in the southwest corner of Southport Business Park. Mr. Collier. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, yes, this, this item seeks uh, approval of Resolution 1908, which accepts the public improvements completed to date for Parcel Map 4888. Um, parcel Map 4888 was approved by the City Council in February of 2018. As a condition of approval of the map, certain public improvements were required to be constructed, including the extension of Ramus Drive, a new traffic signal at Southport Parkway, water, sewer, storm drain, and landscaping improvements. All of the required improvements have been completed with the exception of two items. <clears throat> the installation of landscaping and fencing along the project boundary with the SIP detention pond and a new underground electric connection to the detention pond pump station. This item seeks acceptance of the improvements which have been completed to date. The items which have not been completed will require future council acceptance when they are completed. A performance security totaling the value of the incomplete items is being withheld in order to ensure the completion in compliance with the subdivision uh, improvement agreement. Thank you, Mr. Collier. I'm going to turn it back to Council for any clarification or questions. Council Member Guerrero. Thank you. Um, the question I have is under the analysis of uh, the PD21 requirements that it seems like uh, the additional um, uh, foliage that, you know, the, the area beyond the fence and what was supposed to be about 15 feet mm -hmm. of um, landscaping that needed to be done, but the fence is on the property line and beyond that is RD 900 property, which we cannot do anything about. Correct. And I'm interested, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm, for that, that's unacceptable to me. I think that a plan needed to be considered and um, to incorporate what was under um, PD 21 because when a homeowner is looking at purchasing their property, and um, I've met with the property owners a few times, and um, in purchasing the property and anticipating that they will have some kind of buffer, they knew the buildings were going to be built there, um, and the detention basin, you know, was also um, built there after after PD twenty one. So, you know, and. The detention basin was built there after PD-21, so they should have known PD-21 was going to be going on as well. Um, and there were some requirements they needed to fulfill. And so I don't know, you know, how we can look at a way to address the situation, because I, I just don't see that this, that this uh, accepting that we can't do anything moving forward is, is fair to the residents that um, are having to deal with the situation today. Just for clarification, I have a question, Mr. Collier. Um, the matter with respect to the landscaping is not before the council at this juncture. Is that correct to say? That's correct. Okay, so the the question, uh, the line of questioning by Councilmember Guerrero, while it being valid, um, is not something that's before this council this evening. That's going to come at a later date. That's correct. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Ledesma. Uh, yeah, that, that was going to get to that point because um, your point aside, which <laughs> I'm tending to agree with, but um, we're going to have another bite at the apple around landscaping. That, that comes back here to council, correct? That is correct. Okay, and then uh, the other issue that's not completed is the pump installation. It, no, it's, it's a new electrical connection uh -huh. to, electrical the, connection, to I'm the sorry, pump that's station that's existing. Thank yeah. you. Um, and I made a note to this, I think, um, um, because the agree in, in there you got it, you have a five-year sort of 
time period you built into the agreement, right? That they, they had to get this done in five years. bg and &E had to get that done. Well, the agreement allows for completion of the required improvements within five years of the date of commencement of the improvements, okay? Uh, so they've, comm they've commenced and the, the clock has ticked. It also requires that um, the improvements be completed prior to the final of any building permit or issuance of certificate of occupancy within the subdivision or, or the affected parcel. So um, the landscape improvements that are adjacent to the, uh, the, the building that's been constructed out there already, mm -hmm. those need to be completed in their entirety and accepted by council before we issue a final on that building permit. As, as the wall will extend further to the west and those parcels are developed, the same will apply. The wall will have to be completed for that stretch. I'm sorry, not a wall, a fence and, and landscaping prior to uh, building permit final for those parcels. Okay, I think I understand that. So, so part of my feedback on this is, is I think I'm trying to find it in the, because the way the staff report is written, um, it's PG&E that they're depending on to kind of get that, some of that work. Done. It is PG&E, they, they currently don't have capacity in Southport Parkway okay. to, to run that connection. Right. I've spoken with PG&E, we have in writing that um, with the second phase of development out there, the next parcel that they're planning to construct, there is a, a route that they can take and capacity available to make the connection at that time. Okay, I just want it built in somewhere along the lines. Uh, 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 with whatever, with a developer, whomever, at these come online, is that this right in PG&E or any successor utility agency that will get this work done? Um, right. Because I don't want that as an excuse right. um, when it's the time's up. So um, I just kind of flag that as sort of a staff clarification to make sure we okay. have that mark. So this isn't necessarily you. I know you're, you're putting the hooks in, mm -hmm. but I uh, just seeing how that goes, it's, it's kind of a potential out that I, I don't want any, they, they need to get this work done and we'll get back to the landscaping in a minute, so. Okay. Okay. Any other further questions? I'm still look, waiting for my response on the question that I gave you. And I know it's not a part, but it is part of the analysis, and I would. Uh, just for clarification, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Collier, it's my understanding by a review of this item that we are to accept only the items that have been completed today, and we are not accepting any of the proposal with respect to the fencing, um, and that is going to be something that once it is completed and brought to the council, we will then have the opportunity to, to discuss. And I mean, not to say that we can't, consider that but on the other hand I just I'm wondering if um, how it relates to item 11 well, well maybe that's what adds a little bit of confusion which is why we have you know I think quite a few speakers is that it is a part of the analysis and considering that it is subject to discussion at this point okay. and, it's, well. and, and if it's a clarification you need to provide mm -hmm. on what it is we're voting for today for those that are here um, who came in to um, express their concerns. And uh, i like to make sure that, that there is a response to that as well. So if it's not gonna be this issue, just help us to understand what it is that, give us a timeline on, on what we to expect and what, to do, um, what we're going to be doing to address the concerns of the residents. Well, I, I'm not sure how many of them understand what, what's been approved. Um, and what our interpretation and application of the requirements of the PD-21 are. Um, there will be, as required um, in the PD text, a, an eight foot tall fence covered with vines. Mm -hmm. um, and there will also be a continuous row of vegetation trees um, along the entire boundary. They won't be on the south side of the fence, they'll be on the, the north side of the fence on the, on the, on the parcel side. The so, side. Okay. so from, that's a, not, from that's a visual okay. screening perspective, um, I, I believe that staff felt that we had met the intent of, of, the, of the PD-21 text. Okay. Okay. I think there's public comment. There I think is. there's public comment yeah, on that. Yeah, that we'll, we'll, let, we'll find out what other comments and questions come up here. Thank you. But at this time, I'm going to uh, take some public comment from some of the folks that have been waiting here. Uh, we're going to start with Edna Bohannon.
Ms. Bohannon. Hi. <coughs> please approach the podium, Ms. Bohannon. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Oh, please approach the podium, and if you need to lower it, there yes, you go. Yes, I think so. It's not made for short There people. is. A, they can actually lower the entire podium if you wish. On There's a Better. button on the side. Oh. Okay. Sorry, Bro, quick. <laughs> Just, <laughs> the, assistance is coming, yeah. There we go. Oh, thank you. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> Thanks, Roberta. Okay. My name is Edna Bohannon, and I live on um, Solomon Island Road, and I have lived there for 13 years. And um, I represent myself, and I also represent the 75 or more neighbors that I have spoken to. I spoke to them last uh, February when I walked the neighborhood. I spoke again to them in October. Um, where I walked the neighborhood again, and I spoke to some of them again this past Sunday. Out of the 75 to 100 people I spoke to, I only had one person who was not concerned about what was going on with the warehouses and, and the landscaping. It seems to me that the pond, um, what's good for the pond is good for the residents. The pond needs to be protected because of the 189 species that, that are there. It was a de detention basin, but now it is a wetland. And we have lots of birds, ducks, and other um, critters that are in there. But the things that I, I am deeply concerned about is that we do have this eight-foot fence. I wish it were a wall, but I'll take um, uh, a chain-link fence. We would like to have the vegetation, as it's been stated to, uh, in, in the material. And we would like to have a row of trees. It would be wonderful if we had a row of uh, redwood trees. And the whole point of that is that it would protect the sound that would help us as neighbors, but would also help the birds, the ducks, and the other critters. We would also like the lighting to be changed because the lighting reflects on the pond and that it's not good for um, birds that migrate. Songbirds migrate, and when they migrate, they need the stars, and if there's too much ambient light, then they get disoriented and they go someplace else. But the other thing that we would like is um, that um, a concern for me is about safety. Uh, I worked in Oakland for 25, 30 years, and we all know that in an urban environment, when there's an interface between um, in industry and suburbia, if there is not a good kind of wall or some kind of barrier, crime goes up in the neighborhoods that are re uh, in relationship to the industry. And I do not want to see the part of West Sacramento, Southport that I live in. I grew up in West Sacramento. I graduated from James Marshall High School. So I am really a dedicated, caring person about uh, this community. I love it. And that's why I moved back when I uh, semi-retired. So we don't want you to pass this uh, resolution until we have some assurance that we are going to get these needs met. And we have not yet to get any assurance from city staff. They have refused to speak with us. And we don't understand because we are the residents and we want to be respected. And I'm asking you tonight to listen to us. I represent, like I said, almost 100 people. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bohannon. Um, Mr. City Manager, I'm sorry. I, there was a representation by Ms. Bohannon that uh, there have been some city staff that have been refusing to meet with the residents. Do you know anything about that? I can't speak to that specifically. I know there has been lots of communication with different uh, residents uh, out there. And actually, before the meeting, I uh, introduced myself to a couple of them and planned to uh, have a meeting. But um, but yeah, I mean, I, there, there's been different communications with different residents uh, of that area with staff over the past several months. Well, I appreciate your uh, city managers making himself available to speak with residents in, in the community. So Can thank you, Can you give Ms. us Lohan. some idea how soon that's going to be? I'm going to leave that off the record so that he can contact you all and make those arrangements. We've been trying since February. You have his express. Uh, it's actually recorded, so okay. you can hold him to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next comment from Margaret Berry. Good evening, Ms. Berry. Good evening. Um, I'm, I'm also concerned. I also live on, on the pond, and I have, I have property there. And I'm also concerned, after reading the city report on this, uh, uh, this uh, matter, that uh, you know, I don't agree with the way 
it's the uh, landscaping is portrayed in, in this uh, city report. Um, two things pop out uh, right off the top. One is, as already has been discussed, um, you know, we don't really agree that the landscaping that's been put in to date is sufficient to meet the P PD 21 re uh, requirements that were enacted as a mitigating factor per the CEQA negative declaration for that development. Um, we're concerned that if, it's, if, if uh, you know, the uh, landscaping is adopted as it is right now, um, it will be repeated. We've heard some assurance that it won't be. We, we really appreciate that. Um, it will be repeated on the rest of the, uh, the properties. Um, we gave you a couple handouts just to give you an idea of what we're looking at here. Uh, the first one is a, a picture of the pond, the uh, housing, and the uh, property that in, in, in uh, question is above it. Uh, the second is a picture that we took off the internet. It shows four buildings proposed. Only two of these have been put into date, buildings labeled one and two. Um, it gives you an idea of you know, where they sit compared to the, uh, the, the, uh, the pond and the fact that this building three here that is just proposed at this point um, is, is really put right up against that boundary. So we'd like to see that move back, have the proper screening put in um, you know, before that is approved. Um, second, we, um, we don't really agree with the interpretation that the PD21 requires the 15-foot vegetative uh, screen be installed on the pond side of the property. That argument just seems fairly ridiculous. It's kind of a tortured reading of this, um, uh, of this, uh, this type of developer responsibility. Um, you know, normally, the, the developer is required to screen the industrial property um, from the, the residents. Um, so it makes sense that it will be on their property. Uh, that just seems kind of plain to me. So it seems like that was missed during the, the initial uh, approval of the, uh, you know, the landscaping plan there. Um, yeah, like I said, we don't think that the, uh, the, the, the existing landscaping meets the, um, the requirements. We'd like to see, you know, the part that's really uh, the most egregious is the truck bays went in next to Southport. There is absolutely no trees right now between the truck bays and the pond. So there's an unobstructed view there. There might be some little bits of shrubbery put in. Um, hopefully we'll get some, some more uh, trees there. You know, that, that will be considered because right now it's an open view. And that's, you know, the trucks will be coming and going, it'll be noisy. You know, it's kind of crazy there. So, uh, you know, we'd, we'd like to talk to the city and we'd like to give our input, input to what else can be put in there in terms of landscaping. So I appreciate uh, your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barry. Uh, Wendy Matuka. Ms. Matuka. Good evening. Thanks. Good evening. Uh, thanks. Thanks for hearing us. Um, I also live on Solomon Island Road by the pond. Um, the landscape screening requirements between the pond and the warehouse is to shield objectionable views and it was identified as a mitigating measure by the CEQA negative, uh, mitigating negative deck back in the 90s. There have been no objectionable, objectionable views to screen until the recent development. It was all just grassland. Um, this landscape screen should have been required on the site plan for the warehouse prior to approval, but it wasn't. We looked at the plan. We looked at the site plan down at the planning uh, department, and it, it's not there. I, I think they. I think they just made a mistake. It, it's, it's, it's a requirement from the '90s. I think they didn't realize it was there. Now, however, rather than admit the mistake and take reasonable steps to correct it as best as is feasible, city staff is pretending that no mistake was made. Um, if if you look at the the, the report that you have. They're, they're reading the PD21 text to require the landscape screen, which is the vine-covered fence with the 15 feet of, of continuous tree screening, which actually has a meaning in West Sacramento because you have development guidelines that describe what continuous screening means. Um, they're saying that that was supposed to be on the neighbor's property, not, not on the developer's property. There's nothing to screen until the developer develops but when something has to be screened, it's supposed to go on the neighbor's property. I mean, that, that reading is, is unsupported. It is completely arbitrary. I mean, I, 
I, I, I don't think you'd ever get a court to agree that that is what the ordinance means. And so I, I welcome if I welcome what I heard tonight that we are not deciding anything at all tonight about the landscaping because my concern is that because if you read what the city says, they're reading the PD21, and I heard Mr. Collier say it at the beginning, they're reading it to mean that the landscaping should go in on the RD side. And we know the RD has said no. What he's saying is that there should be no screening for the rest of the entire length of that property when the, when the rest of the properties get developed. You, you've, got the, you've got the picture, the proposed uh, vision of, of what's going to go in. That's the majority of the frontage. And, and so it seems like rather than create that mistake and replicate the error that was made on this first parcel, we need to recognize what the PD21 text says and have the proper screening on the remaining parcels, understanding that the interpretation in this report is incorrect, and then just work on planting a few more trees on the parcel that's already been developed. And again, I take exception to what's said in the report because they talk about having put in additional landscaping, saying they're going to put in additional landscaping and that has been installed. No additional landscaping has been installed since the initial landscaping was put in pursuant to the original plan. So I just think there is, um, I don't understand what reality they're talking about. We live there, we're, we're mostly birders. We all have scopes. <laughs> we can see what's going on. Um, so uh, thank you very much for hearing us. Thank you, Ms. Matuka. And we did receive your correspondence, so I appreciate your advocacy. Okay, thank you. Uh, Judy Bohannon. Good evening. Thank Good evening, you. Ms. Bohannon. I came to give a different perspective to the pond. I actually do not live on Solomon Island. My family does. And I spend quite a bit of time there because of the pond. My sister-in-law has the most fabulous backyard you have ever seen, a beautiful view. When I look out my backyard, I see my neighbor's fence, like you probably do too. This way, we have all of our functions in her backyard because she has a beautiful view. Do you know what it's going to be like if they don't put a barrier? The sound, do you know what the sound of a lot of diesel trucks sound like? They leave their trucks running. They don't shut them off. They run all the time they're there. Not only is it going to be the sound, the smell of diesel fuel, this is a wide open space out there. It's not contained. It's going to come in these people's backyards. You're gonna have a nice family barbecue, a nice family birthday party. What are you gonna do? You're gonna smell diesel fuel. You're gonna hear trucks running. If you're there having a nice evening, lights, it's gonna be absolutely horrible. I really don't know what else to say to you, but I just don't think that this is fair to the people. They live in a unique street, something that the rest of us do not have. I would love to have a backyard like that instead of looking at my neighbor's backyard and my neighbor's fence, which is totally acceptable. I have a nice backyard. My neighbors have a nice backyard. But I don't have the view. I don't have that lovely pond. I don't get to see all the birds that they get to see. It's, it's going to be devastating to those people, and I don't think it's fair to them. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bohannon. Mm -hmm. Are you related to Robert Bohannon? He's my husband. Well, husband, can you please approach the podium? <laughs> now, Mr. Bohannon, do you go to those parties as well? <laughs> Looking forward to hearing from you, sir. Please approach the podium. No, uh, I go along line with my uh, wife, and it... Uh, is you go down South Forth Drive and you see it and they do have the light in and s some trees along the sidewalk. But a fence is not going to do it. It's going to be a barrier that you need. Then you can put the trees on the south side of the 
of a barrier, a wall, because of the noise and such. And if you've been in commercial areas before, not only are you, you hear the trucks and we leave them running, when we back up, we now designated to have our horns or a bell ring, and that's constant. And uh, we don't support this. We, su we suggest you vote no on this proposition of this, and appreciate Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bohannon. I appreciate you coming out. Oh, I know this name. Cliff Feldheim. Hi. Mr. Feldheim. Thank you, you. Thank you for your time this evening. Um, we, we've heard about the detention basin. I want to spend some time uh, talking about the wildlife of the detention basin. I've been a resident. Uh, we bought our home there along the pond in 2002. Been there ever since. Uh, professionally, I'm a wildlife biologist. I've been a professional wildlife biologist for almost 25 years now. And back in 2003, uh, we started with, in cooperation with the Reclamation District, uh, Bridgeway Island Elementary School had recently opened and we started an adopt a wetland program, uh, bringing all the grades out to the pond. And for the last 17 years now, I've been bringing the third grade out there as part of their city wildlife unit. Um, it's been a, a big part of our community, uh, teaching the kids uh, conservation stewardship. We actually have them planting native grasses at time, picking up trash, and doing wildlife surveys. So a tremendous resource has developed there. And me personally, I've identified over 150 species of birds using, using the detention basin um, with uh, other native wildlife like river otters and western pond turtles, uh, both species of special concern. Uh, one actually a candidate species for listing right now, um, regular visitors to the pond. So tremendous wildlife use. Uh, locally, birders from throughout the Sacramento region come to the area. Um, I talk, uh, I've been working with the Reclam Reclamation District since 2003 as sort of their public outreach. Um, I meet with the birders, I talk to them about the, the city, about the detention basin, about what we're doing, how we manage for storm water out there, what we do to prevent mosquitoes. So interact with the public. A tremendous resource for our, our community. And, uh, three years ago now, um, the biological uniqueness of the area got recognized by some researchers at UC Davis and with USGS, the Western Ecological Research Station out of Dixon, and they incorporated the pond into a five-year study uh, across seven western states of cinnamon teal and blue wing teal. The pond itself has some of the highest densities of cinnamon teal and blue wing teal ever recorded in the Pacific Flyway. And so this study, they've been putting transmitters on birds, tracking all their movements for the last three years. And the blue winged teal in the pond have been nesting in Alberta, British Columbia, Northwest Territories, and Saskatchewan. And then each of the last three winters returning to the detention basin. Mm -hmm. So it, it's been great. We've incorporated that into actually Bridgeway Island Elementary School. The fifth grade science club came out and put some transmitters on birds. We tracked bird migration in the classroom. You know, tremendous resource tremendous bird use. My concern, um, you heard a couple people reference the CEQA document. CEQA document was done in 1997, and the environmental baseline at that time was an agricultural field. And so the a proper environmental review has never been done. Thank you, Mr. Feldheim. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Nice to see you. Likewise. Uh, Tim Staffler. Mr. Staffler. Hello, thank you for hearing me. Um, if you want to raise the podium, there's a button on the right. I live on uh, Penn Island Street. I live directly across from the new development. Um, one of my big concerns, it, besides we've been talking about the uniqueness of that pond, is the loss of value to our real estate. Uh, <clears throat> we bought this house, we bought it we fell in love with the pond. We said, this is where we want to live uh, because of that pond. And because you could look out, you could look through the reflection of the pond, it was open area. We realized there was going to be a building there. Um, we didn't realize how devastating the, the appearance of that building would be. As you walk up to the pond, you no longer see the pond, you see the reflection of the building. At nighttime, 
we now have to close our drapes and our second story windows because the lights that reflect off the pond and come off the building are so bright that you can, you can walk around the house without light. Uh, you can walk outside without light. Um, <clears throat> it's a, as you can tell by everybody that's talking, it's an emotional uh, problem for us as far as I have a wide open backyard. <clears throat> now I stay out in the backyard and I'm trying to make my own screens so that I don't have to look at this building. Um, <clears throat> I was there last night looking at the new, con the new construction of the fence, which is directly on the, the property line. Uh, there's nine feet at one point between the fence and the fire lane. And not the what? And the fire lane. That's not very much room to put uh, landscaping. Uh, I'm not used to speaking in public. Uh, Mr. Collier stated that there's going to be a row of trees. Right now there are four uh, deciduous ornamental trees. <clears throat> They're going to drop their leaves this winter. There's not going to be any screening during the winter. Um, I just I urge that the, the council not uh, pass this agenda item uh, and make sure that everything is done possible to provide as much screening as possible. And don't let them screen that entire development based on that one corner that they put too close to the uh, retention pond. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Stavler. <clears throat> Our uh, final speaker card is from Amanda Scott. <coughs> Hi, good evening. Um, I'm also one of the residents who lives um, near the pond, and I basically echo the sentiments that have been spoken here today. Um, since construction began, our beautiful, quiet backyards that we all loved um, turned into less than beautiful with the, the building, but that's um, probably not even as painful as the incredibly bright lights um, all the time. That night obviously is more noticeable, but lights are on all the time, constant noise. We've uh, recently, I guess, got sideshows or dragsters or something that's taken up the parking lots. So every single night we now hear screeching tires and just chaos up, up until 1.30, 2 o'clock the other night. And it's not a unique, and not a unique event. Um, I guess I find it disheartening that that the statute was interpreted any other way than as written as far as where the vegetation is supposed to be. Um, I just, I really hope that, that the council has an opportunity to look at this more closely before you approve anything. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, Mr. Carlier, uh, where's Mark Carlier? Oh, there you go. Uh, did you want to take the opportunity to respond to any of the, the concerns expressed? Uh, sure. So, admittedly, the, the, the language in the uh, report kind of jumps to the conclusion that the, um, the fence is put on the property line. And as such, the requirement for the landscaping to be on the south side does encroach on some, on RD900 property, which creates a problem. Um, <clears throat> there were a number of reasons why we didn't consider pushing the fence back 15 feet onto the parcel property. Um, you know, it's this, you envision an eight foot tall fence that's going to be covered with vines <coughs> with basically a no man's <coughs> land on the, on the south side that's going to be maintained by the property owner that doesn't see it. And then further down to the west, you're going to have the same situation with a different property owner. And uh, maintaining, assuring long term uh, irrigation and maintenance of that could potentially be a problem. You've got s hundreds of feet of uh, landscape area unlit on the pond side of the fence saw that as a potential security concern um, primarily probably to the industrial property camping whatever um, I think there was also some uh, setback issues associated with that that maybe uh, planning could address but that's why we, we attempted to take the intent of the language which we interpreted as the requirement to visually screen the industrial development f f uh, from the residential and tried to make it fit as best we could uh, in what we had. 
Um, the comment about the lack of trees uh, planted and the timing of the planting. Um, the plants that were put in with the original landscaping on the parcel, um, they're toyons, they're eight foot on center, and they're anticipated to grow to 15 feet in height. Eight feet on center, the entire length of the parcel. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back to council for any additional questions. Uh, council Member Ledesma. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I'm just going to make some comments. and. Um, this is uh, a little bit for me uh, um, uh, deja vu, or uh, uh, um, I've, I've seen this before, on, only because I haven't been with on the planning commission in the 2000s. Uh, this is a subject we took up back then um, around screening of um, the industrial buildings along Southport uh, Parkway all the way towards Bridgeway as it was getting de developed. And uh, we had a lot of discussion at that time around fencing and landscaping and the need. And you got to remember back then, we did not have nearly the growth. A lot of these residents probably weren't there at that point, or some of them, maybe original homeowners, moved into that neighborhood then. Uh, but we sort of foresaw that. Now that I know PD 21, um, the agreement's in place for this, um, it's important. I think everyone understands it. Uh, we're in place long before even we had that bite of the apple back then, uh, which makes us a terribly difficult position for city staff, whose charge is to try to implement this, as well as protect the city uh, from a developer who feels they have they have entitled rights to build there. Um, and uh, legal recourse if we don't allow them. They're balancing that and balancing neighbors who have, um, I, I will say, a, 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 a very um, emotional uh, 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 piece of their property or their, their, their neighborhood that isn't quite what they wanted or envisioned. And uh, they're listening and I'm listening and it's important that you understand that. This is, this is gonna be an imperfect solution. It really is, because we're in this quandary between neighbors who I get it. We saw this, we saw this coming, and I wish uh, we would have had a little bit more uh, uh, thought around this particular, at least as a pol in the policy realm, around this part of the nexus to where the residents began um, and where they would end up. The detention pond, which wasn't quite there yet, um, or it was, it was there by the time I was, I was there, but these buildings were a long way off. We never, we, we, they weren't there. And uh, so I get it, and we get it, I think, and staff is, I trust staff. I heard from residents tonight um, um, have lots of questions of staff, and that's okay. Uh, it's really, it really is okay, and the part I'm trying I have a lot of questions of staff too, uh, because the neighbors, I appreciate, as the Mayor Pro Tem had said, I appreciate your advocacy. I know you've been talking, or you haven't reached out to me, I know you've reached out to Councilman Guerrero, some of you have, um, and reached out to others. Uh, I appreciate your advocacy. This is your neighborhood. And I always kind of, when I, we get into these kind of discussions, uh, my personal uh, approach to them is we got to share the neighborhood. They had a right to build there. You have a right to a great neighborhood and using all the amenities to it. And it was at that, uh, the, your development, uh, I forgot when I was, uh, but admiring the new houses that are going up there, the detention pond, and you have a great view of the Western skyline and the Pacific flyway. And it's, I brought this up to staff a few times. That's an amenity that we don't really get to see. Uh, we, uh, no, we don't, I want to say as a city, we don't, talk about river, riverfront access or anything. Uh, we have trail systems built into the plan and everything else, but it really is beautiful. And I, so I get your concerns and I get your, um, uh, kind of where, where you're coming from. I will say this, um, and I did talk to the city manager was yesterday, I think around this and, and uh, our community development director, uh, we need to find a solution to this. Um, and we, we do, I know they, this, this developer, they have entitled rights. 
and I'm not sure I'm going to have all the, I'm, I'm not the landscape designer. I'm not the, uh, I don't have PD-21. I'm not legally going to dissect and parse words and what it meant. I can tell you my intent, we talked about this 10 years ago, 15 years ago. I think, Jeff, you were there um, when we took this on. Our intent was clear. We've got to block, visually block um, um, the warehouse buildings. That was the intent. Uh, we were convinced at that time, uh, I think Fotinia was, was used in some of these areas as a growth mechanism. It grows fast, grows tall. I know I got them in my back backyard. I can't control them. They grow really fast. Um, and we were convinced to go with that method versus concrete walls and barriers, which then become, as you just pointed, they can be um, nuisance. Um, what's the word you use? They, they can become nuisance in their own way because of graffiti and other areas, but uh, we were convinced that landscaping walls and visual aids were, were part of it. Um, but um, I'm not um, having, having some discussion with staff on this. I'm not uh, one to sort of this, I'm not approving this uh, today, or, or I should say, if, I've, if I do approve this today, it's not without, uh, I know we have another bite at the apple. I have some questions about what I'm approving today around landscaping plans. And um, the developer has, has got to share the neighborhood. Now, they have entitled rights, I get it. And we have a legal, um, I know the attorney's whispering over there because I know I'm <laughs> walking a line here um, because well, my you're, job you're, is also, a, um, I also have a job to protect the city's, uh, the liabilities, financial liabilities of the city. Um, but they need to, our, our, our residents are talking, and they haven't been there 15 years ago in, in dealing with this. I can tell you our intent was to make sure there was visual screening. So I know that, that the building was built. I don't know the solution for this. That's not my job. I can tell you, but at a policy level, my priority is that there's visual screening there. Right. So I, I was going to make one suggestion, and that is um, it's not that these are not all connected. But the item on the agenda tonight is the acceptance of a set of public improvements and the conversation that some of the residents would like to have and maybe the council would like to have is a bit broader than what's on the agenda. And I don't know if there's a desire to have some sort of presentation prior to the screening, prior to the uh, fence acceptance and landscaping coming back to sort of uh, give the council an update and the community on the history of, of SIP, this project, where the entitlements are, you know, because you're, um, you're kind of being dropped into the middle and really towards the end. Of yeah, the it's the last the chapter, the literally the, the last two chapters of this, of this I mean, I, story. I, it's not my job to make work for your staff. So yeah, just, I'll, I'll <laughs> chime in on that. I, I do agree with the, with, with the city attorney on that suggestion. I think it would be good to kind of uh, revisit some of the history here of how we got here, but also give us some more time to, um, before it comes back, with the I, landscaping improvements. Yeah, I was going to go back to this because because the actual staff report, and I appreciate it seems like a simple, in any other development we have, this is probably a simple ministerial act. Um, it really is. And so I don't want the public to fail, like, uh, at least from my point of view, this that we've seen this a few times before, just not this one, but where they, they've completed infrastructure or whatever else. But what got me on the staff report was the fact that you're, um, is, um, sorry, I'm age um, uh, in the background uh, as a condition of approval certain public improvements are required to be completed including roadway water sewer storm drain which is all typical stuff and landscape improvements so I, what I want to understand what's not in here I want because in, in PD 21 which I haven't seen in 15 years whatever but not in here so I want to be able to like be able to see this a little more have a little more background on this um, uh, and I want a message to go really clearly to the developer that, I, at least my perspective, um, we, we've got to come to the table on this. I know they don't have any legal rationale to do so, but they got to share the neighborhood and they got to listen to neighbors. And I'm telling the neighbors right now, I was, this is going to be an imperfect answer. We're dealing with, uh, with this. This is my, my perspective. I'll let my colleagues voice their own opinion. But I'm I, I'm not ready. I'm not sure this this particular someone's got to convince me that this particular report is ripe because I don't understand 
if we have landscape improvements coming back to us, what am I approving in this? As it mentions, um, uh, landscape improvements are part of what we're accepting. Um, so so I, I do think it might be useful to ask Mark to clarify, because there are improvements that have been completed that I think it is important for the city to accept. Uh, a signal, road improvements, these are things that are either already or will shortly be in use by the public, and they should be under the control of the city before that happens. So what is what you were being asked to accept are all the required improvements, including those that we've listed, with the exception of the landscaping that everyone's concerned about along the boundary of the detention pond and the electrical, new underground electrical connection mm -hmm. to the storm drainage pump station. So there are some landscaping improvements, I'm sorry. What oh. I want to be clear on though is if there are any improvements in here that we accept tonight, mm -hmm. will they in any way inhibit our ability to maybe get something we would want later? So, so are we creating, I, 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 I can't think of what that is at the moment, but I, I, what I don't want to have happen, Mark, right. yeah, is we come back at the landscaping. We could have done that, but because we already accepted that improvement, we can't go back on that now. I don't, that's not something I wanted. No, the, I, I, I don't see that at all. I mean, the landscaping improvements that we're accepting are along the boundary of one of the parcels and, and the detention pond, and the, the improvements that we're accepting are all within the public right away. Okay. All the other improvements. I think I've, uh, I know my colleagues might. Yeah, the other part I'd point out on that is, and Mark, correct me if I'm off here, but the uh, deferral is only good until the finalization of a building permit or certificate of occupancy for the building that's complete. That's correct. So there is that piece as well. The council has to accept the landscaping prior to occupancy of the building. We, we have that hook and we have a performance security that we're holding to that it covers the cost of uh, required landscape improvements which won't be released until you accept them also just so I'm clear so so they they, they can't get their COO until until, until the landscaping in, in of, of concern is uh, accepted by the city that's correct right okay. council member Guerrero thank you my concern is in approving this tonight is that this discussion is not in this report. And I, I would have preferred to have seen a little more as far as I do see a little bit, but it's not mm -hmm. clear. It's vague in, in the report. And I appreciate that we are having the conversation, but it, for me, given that this is not the first time I've heard from the residents, there have been a number of, of back and forth as you've described, and I think a lot of public record requests to understand in order for the residents to understand what was expected as this development was being, was moving forward. And I myself asked the city manager, just in a photo and is PD 21, are we in compliance with PD 21? And the answer was yes. And this report does not re was, is reflecting that we are not to the extent, and so I think I think I, I'd like to have a, just for my own comfort, and you know, given given that this is our job to make sure that these things are written and, and moving forward, because I cannot feel comfortable, and I and I think I'm pretty consistent in accepting and voting on something unless, unless it's clear in the report. And I, and I want to make sure that, you know, staff understand that as they prepare a report, especially the history and the interaction with the residents and the letters we have received. This is not a letter that we received when this report, I didn't even know this was coming up tonight. There was a letter prior to that circulated to um, city council on this particular issue and we were made aware of this. And uh, so this is not the first time we heard from the residents about this particular issue. And that's why I'm you know, struggling with the provingness tonight. I, I would prefer to have it rewritten so that it's clear everything we talked about is in this report, and then I would feel more comfortable approving this. 
I could suggest one alternative. You could limit your acceptance tonight to improvements that are actually within the public right-of-way. And that would be street improvements. The signal would not include any landscaping unless there's landscaping actually there within there is landscaping the right-of-way. But it would Park all Parkway. be improvements that have been built within the public right-of-way. And so I think that would be a bright line that would be relatively easy for staff to explain exactly what was and was not accepted at, at tonight's meeting. Mark, is there, um, are there, is, is that an acceptable <laughs> middle ground? And Councilmember Guerrero, would you be willing to accept that amendment to this, uh, to this item? So how is that written into the record so it's clear? Um, well, the distinction would be only the improvements that are within public right away. So that would be that line. Um, and while while they're looking, I would also so, add that. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Go I ahead. was going to say, in the resolution, we have um, the effective paragraph. Now, be it resolved, the council accepts the public improvements completed to date. We would, we could simply add the public improvements located within the public right of way completed to date. that make sense and then public improvements located within public right-of-way completed to date and oh. then that's and then period after that well it would be the public improvements com um, within public right-of-way completed to date as a requirement of parcel map 48 and approve the release of associates the rest of it would remain the same but you would be, so instead of um, just everything that has been completed to date, the acceptance would be just of those within the public right of way. Okay, I'd like to return this. Would you be willing to open up the public comment? I don't know if you actually closed it. Well, we didn't open it, public, public it's not a public so. hearing. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll just add also uh, the earlier suggestion that when this item comes back, it would be fairly soon, uh, that the improvements could be done. Uh, that we would add to that more background on PD21 and kind of the history of how we, we got to this um, this place. So as, as the city attorney suggested earlier. Well, go ahead. Council Member Ledesma. Go ahead. You're timely. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I just, uh, there's nothing um, more uh, important than preserving the sanctity of the place that someone calls home. Um, the, the you know and the peaceful enjoyment of the the residents to enjoy what they've known as uh, the you know to reflect the complexion of their home for many years has been disrupted, and so it's no wonder that we have uh, such passionate advocates here tonight to speak for what it is that they wish to preserve. So I respect that, and I'm I'm very happy that you're here late at night. I'm sad actually that you're not home with your families, but or birding. Um, uh, uh, but in all fairness, I, the, the, the fact that everyone had come out tonight and spoke so passionately about um, this issue is, is important, and we're hearing you. Uh, we're not a full council tonight, but the three of us that are here uh, hear you loud and clear, and we've received your correspondence and uh, respect uh, that, that, uh, ang the, the, the advocacy that you're providing regarding this issue. A lot of this stuff tonight, I mean, there, there was education on a variety of different issues, whether it be the light, whether it be the habitat, whether it be the noise or the, uh, the smells or just the activity that, that's going on now that, that's new and, and unwelcome. But um, I also respect that, you know, in the words of my fellow council member that, you know, who has a little bit of history here in the city with the planning commission as well, um, that, you know, there has to be some type of middle ground that's going to be acceptable or maybe not perfect, uh, you know, by both sides. But if we're going to live together and we, we all want the same thing, right? We just want to live happily and, and peacefully and, and enjoy uh, our investments. We have to find a way to make that work. And so I'm really um, encouraged by the city manager's offer to meet with residents and, and follow up with your concerns and see if we can find that compromise. Um, and I, at the beginning of this item, I wanted to just clarify what it is that we were looking at here tonight, because I do know in some of the feedback there was some cons cons um, maybe some confusion, you know, of you should turn it down. And th th I can understand why, because there, you know, it wasn't perfectly uh, understandable, especially for someone like me to, who doesn't have a planning background. 
Uh, I had to ask, ask a lot of questions like, what is it if I say yes to this? What am I saying yes to? And that was accepting the public improvements, um, specifically those that, uh, that were excluding the, uh, the items that we were talking about tonight, as well as another that had to do with the electrical storm drain. And so that gave me comfort knowing that we would have a more extended time frame to make changes or uh, find other possibilities that might be amenable. Um, so it wasn't at all to shut down the discussion. I'm actually very happy that we're able to receive this information in time to, to digest it and also ask additional questions as we, come, you know, as we bring that item forward in the future. Uh, but that said, if this council does vote yes uh, on the item, it would be to ac only accept the public improvements. And if we accept that amendment, that would be located on the right of way um, to date. So it would not be addressing the, the fencing uh, aspect of it. And let me just defer to Mr. Collier. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to turn it back to council if there's any further questions or uh, regarding this matter. And if not, um, if we're ready at this juncture to move and accept just those items, those um, Im improvements that were on the right of way. So, Council Member Ledesma. Uh, it's just to add to your point, um, I can get comfortable, but I, I just want to make clear I do appreciate city staff. Um, they should be available to you. And, um, and, and thanks uh, to our city manager. Um, for doing that, but I'm but I'm going to also ask staff um, because you guys have said your piece. But but I'm going back to we're working with a applicant partner here who needs to understand um, clearly that because uh, I can speak to the intent it may not be clear in PD twenty one written word, mm -hmm. but if you want, I'm sure somebody in city staff has a VHS tape of. The meetings we had with Charlie Moore and Ron Morazzini <laughs> and Planning Commission days, we talked about fencing and this issue and what we intended. Verbally, uh, um, our thought process was Charlene was there. We wanted fencing going up all around it. And um, and I, I just urge staff to remind them of that. We And um, sharing the neighborhood, to, at least to me, is an important principle. Um, just, I know they have entitlements. It doesn't give them leeway to just bypass us. And I'm asking staff um, to use whatever uh, mechanisms uh, we have to make sure they understand that we can, we can get someplace farther than this, um, because that's equally as important. Um, I don't, um, that's just my thought. Thank you. Council Member Guerrero. Thank you. So in looking at the public right of way is, is a clear definition of what exactly that means. And um, hopefully that'll get moving forward in addressing the concerns that were heard tonight. And uh, I'm looking for a timeline on what that looks like and just um, something so that the residents here can anticipate what the next steps are going to be. So. Um, well, again, I think, I think the important points there, we have public improvements that are uh, ready to use, and, and they're in the public right of way, uh, things like signals, roads, uh, that sort of thing. Okay. We also have a clear line that, first of all, the, the landscaping that's of most concern was actually not part of the improvements that were asked to be accepted tonight, but there's also additional improvements in the uh, private realm that uh, would be deferred. I'll point out again the... Uh, the deferral is only until it 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 it, it has to be accepted uh, prior to the building being occupied or even receiving a, a finalization of a building permit. So in terms of a time frame, uh, the shell of the building is nearly complete. So we're we're talking about, um, you know, the the time frame wouldn't be too far away where I would expect the developer want wanting us to accept that. So I think that's an important point for. Um, you know, in terms of uh, where we go from here. So that's eminent at this point that, and is, is there, a, can the developer answer that question when that, when that timeline looks like? Um, I think Mark is probably the best one Mark? to give a sense of that time frame. so. I think it's absolutely eminent. I think they're gonna wanna get this uh, resolved as quickly as possible. They're very close to wanting to get a, uh, a building final on the shell. 
So in the next six months? Oh, much sooner than that. Much sooner, okay. Um, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they wanted something back at the next council meeting. Oh, okay, good, that's great. That'll be no good. guarantees, but I, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Well, then we, we have some work this, this is, cut out for us at this point to get things done between yeah, now and then. Yeah. And that's December 11th. Okay. Yeah. But that we anticipate it may be coming back. I, I anticipate they're going to want to get this resolved as quickly as possible. Okay. I'm glad to hear that. Okay. Thank you so much. And I, I support the um, amendment. Thank you. With that, um, there has been, well, is that a motion <laughs> then to, I, I'll entertain a motion at this juncture to, uh, move item 11 uh, independently as a regular agenda item uh, with the amendment that the now therefore be it resolved be re read as that the City Council of the City of West Sacramento hereby accepts the public improvements completed uh, located around the right of way uh, that are completed to date. Can, can I modify that just slightly? Yes, you may. Thank you. I would suggest hereby accepts the public improvements within the public right of way completed to date. Thank you. And then the remainder stays. Completed to date as a requirement of parcel map 4888 and approves the release of the associated securities and except for the value of those outstanding improvements not being accepted at this time as provided for in the subdivision improvement agreement. Is there a motion? So just quickly again, what does that, I I'm got lost. As I, I, I have located within the public right away, but then it got changed back? It was just a matter of semantics and, okay. and grammar. Okay. Okay, let me, I will include the word located because that makes sense. So it would read, now therefore be it resolved that the City Council of the City of West Sacramento hereby accepts the public improvements located within the public right of way completed to date as a requirement of parcel map 4888 and approves the release of associated securities except for the value of those, par those outstanding improvements not being accepted at this time as provided for in the subdivision improvement agreement. Is everybody else okay with that? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. I move, I move to um, approve that language. Motion made by Martha, uh, excuse, Council Member Guerrero. Uh, I'll second with a notation back to staff on this agreement about our path forward, both the residents and the expectation coming back. Um, with the developer. I know I can't, I can't uh, ask you to get outcomes, but I'm the path, the action I'm asking for is part of my motion, my second. Conditional second made by Council Member Ledesma. Conditional, just a notation. Notated second <laughs> made by Council Member Ledesma. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Uh, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who came in tonight, and uh, we look forward to seeing you back here and or corresponding in the future about the matter. All right. And with that, we are now going to turn to item number 23, consideration and approval of a grant agreement with Mercy <laughs> Coalition of the West Sacramento of West Sacramento and adoption of resolution 19-98 approving appropriation from Measure E fund to fund the Winter Warming Centers 2019 and 2020. Thank you so much for staying with us this late. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and members of the council. Um, tonight, uh, we'll be providing a report on last year's Winter Warming Centers pilot program and also discussing this year's proposed program. Can you please state your name for the record? Oh, my name's Abraham Salinas. I'm a new community investment specialist with the Economic Development and Housing uh, Department. And is this your first presentation before the council? Uh, yes, I give right. one presentation to the Arts <laughs> Commission. Oh, Very did. good, all right. Yeah. Well, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Um, so in August of 2018, the Mercy Coalition of West Sacramento submitted a proposal for a pilot winter warming centers program that would provide uh, food, housing, and other services to homeless individuals in West Sacramento. And then on November 7th, 2018, Council approved a $40,000 grant agreement with the Mercy Coalition. Half of the grant would be, would be funded by Yellow County, allocated to the city via MOU, and the Mercy Coalition 
Also provided funding in addition to in-kind contributions from coalition members for a total program budget of $83,730. Well, there you go. The program was designed by Mercy Coalition volunteers along with uh, regional partners that provide similar services. The program would run for four months rotating at five host sites, five nights a week, and um, would, would provide services for a maximum of 20 guests per night. Weekly referrals were required for guests to, in order to receive services. This was offered by um, the city's homeless outreach and services coordinator winter warming program manager, and, other de and their designees. They would then be picked up at three off-site intake locations and shuttled them to one of the ro rotating host sites. In addition to providing nightly food and shelter, the Winter Warming Centers program provided guests with regular services to assist with accessing permanent housing, health care, mental health services, substance abuse recovery, employment, legal services, and credit repair. If services could not be provided on site, Mercy Coalition staff maintain an up-to-date referral system to provide such services. So uh, the pilot program uh, ran for a total of 76 nights, nights serving 57 individuals. Mercy Coalition staff, along with 200 community volunteers, provided more than 2,600 hours of service. 46 or 81% of individuals in the program were verified to be from West Sacramento or had ties to the city. This graph is showing the performance measures that were required by Yolo County and the city to evaluate the pilot program's effectiveness in reducing the incidence and, pro and impacts of homelessness. The program resulted in maintaining an average of 12 beds filled each night, 13 par participants secured permanent housing, 22 increased their non-cash benefits, and four par participants were able to be employed by the city's downtown streets team. 22 also increased their total income. And when asked if uh, they did not have the winter warming centers as an option, 90% of them reported that they would be sleeping on the streets in a tent or in their cars. The Mercy Coalition also conducted b surveys before and after the pilot program to assess the impact of winter warming centers on local businesses. They were asked to what extent had their businesses been negatively affected by homelessness in West Sacramento and to what extent individuals slept or loitered in their doorway, to what extent they considered urban cleanliness to be an issue on their block, and how many direct negative in interactions they have had with homeless individuals in the past four months. So there was an overall reduction in the negative impacts of homelessness on businesses, but the most notable one was that there was 27% reduction in the, the number of negative interactions with homeless individuals. So the Mercy Coalition also hosted uh, four community meetings throughout the, program's, um, th throughout the program's time. The meetings were not very well attended due to the program's um, distance from residential areas. With that, there were no complaints received from the neighborhood communities and there were only two nonviolent um, calls made to the police department. With that, uh, staff also collected Zen City data, the city's social media sentiment service, and recorded over 400 positive social media interactions related to the winter warming centers. All right, so this is, uh, this year's proposed program is designed the same as the pilot program and will use the same performance measures except for the following changes. This year's grant agreement is increased by $9,000. This is due to nine additional days of service additional budget line items, and increased cost for program staff. There will be three host sites instead of five. This is due to logistics and the capacity of last year's sites to provide an open and comfortable overnight space. This was uh, informed to me by the uh, program summary report. So if approved, the fire department will certify all three host sites prior to uh, operation. And once uh, certified, the warming centers will begin on December 1st, 2019, and will operate through uh, March 26, 2020. That concludes my presentation, and I'll take any questions. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it back to the council for questions or comments. Council Member Guerrero. I um, wanted to find out, and I may, 
I think I'm going to wait for some of my questions, but I did, I did have some questions regarding um, barriers to housing um, because not not there were quite a few actually individuals that um, did have housing, which is great. But any barriers to that they experienced to being able to access um, services, like for example, the CalFresh benefits, um, were a little below target. Um, housing, if there was something we can do, but there was an explanation on some individuals that probably will not be able to achieve housing or things like that. So, if there's an additional presentation or, you know, um, or any any background from uh, those that were um, providing direct services, so whatever I can do to help bridge in any gaps to, to provide that additional support. I know we have a relationship with the county, but. I'm looking for a stronger relationship so that we can meet um, some of the uh, goals that um, are expected here. Of course. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, no questions. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Salinas. I'm going to take public comment at this juncture. Uh, and I have three speaker cards. One I'm going to start with is Cinda Varney. Or is it Linda? No, Cinda. Cinda, all right. Cinda Varney, come on up. Hi. Um, let me start off with saying I was homeless for a, a little over a year here in West Sacramento. Um, Ms. Varney, will you take the microphone and place it real close to you? There we go. I want everybody to hear what you have to say. Okay. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. The warming center <clears throat> gave us a sense of hope. There were people that got together that cared to get involved. A lot of people don't get involved with homeless people because they think we're a certain group of people, and that's not true. We're all different, just like everybody here. Some of us don't wish to be there. It happens. It's a part of life. Because of that warming center, my fiance and I are now in a home with the help of Mark Sawyer, who, uh, yeah. If you guys don't let them continue, do you, can you understand how many people are really going to be hurt and cold and hungry and no hope? That's what that program gave me. Hope. And uh, now I'm a member of the community. I have an idea again. I'm voted, I'm registered to vote. I even have a library card. I've had a library card since I was in grade school. You know, I feel, and I, none of that I would have been able to do if not for that warming center and Mark Sawyer's people. It would have never happened. So I ask you, please, please, really think about what you're doing. A lot of people are dependent on the swarming center. A lot of them. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody want to follow her? <laughs> I'm gonna pick out the hat. Someone, someone like Don Bosley. Come on up. You're the next contestant. I chose you because I knew you could do it. That was, that was amazing. Thank you. Give, give me Thank a you, Kleenex Barney. first or something. Uh, <laughs> good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Council members. It's really great to have a chance to, to get here and to speak. And good to see you again. We're always, always grateful for the opportunity to address Council. So, you know, on behalf of the Mercy Coalition and, and the 14 member churches and the, and the multiple nonprofit partners that we have, we, we do want to thank you again for continuing to consider um, uh, funding the Warming Center. Um, having enjoyed a pretty remarkable maiden voyage with the pilot program last year, we're, we're pretty eager to take some of the lessons that we've learned and build on them. We think there's so much more that we can, we can do that just a baseline has been set. So I won't recite to you last year's um, statistics um, because you already know that there were 76 nights of shelter served at five different churches and 875 total bed nights, uh, 57 different individuals and 19% of those found their way to permanent housing. So I won't tell you that because you already know that. But I do wanna share with you three more intangible characteristics that, this, that, were, that you invested in when you invested in the warming centers last year. 
This is real stuff, and it's, and it's evidenced in the lives of some of the people that were served. The first thing is, is that you invested in the city's compassion. We learned in the most beautiful way that if you build a scaffolding for West Sacramentans to serve, to come and care for the vulnerable, that West Sacramentans will show up and do that to the tune of hundreds of volunteers uh, coming out night after night in the cold and rain to serve. And um, it was, uh, <laughs> by the time it was over, they were competing to get on the volunteer lists rather than having grown tired of them, and it was amazing. The second thing is, is you invested in the city's imagination. You really did, because the Warming Center concept had all kinds of challenges to it when we first brought it uh, 18 months ago and began to craft it together with city staff. The nonprofit partners and everybody else, Mark Sawyer and those who got involved to craft it, were um, very innovative in their approach to how to do referrals, how to do intake systems, uh, collaborative use of transportation. All of these things were very, very innovative, and people had to get imaginative to figure out how to do it, especially in a bunch of small churches, and they did. And um, to the point where they kept creating new opportunities, by the time the Warming Center ended and our program manager, Nicole Ring Collins, uh, became the most popular person in the city, <laughs> then uh, our partner Shores of Hope came along and provided a caseworker position so that she could continue to work in the city. And it's that kind of creative collaboration that you incited when you, you funded the Warming Center in the first time. And third and final, you invested in our city's transcending communal spirit. Uh, the pilot warming centers were executed by people of every political stripe across every age and background and ethnicity, doctrine and creed coming together to do something real special in this community. We can't wait to do it again. So I hope you'll give us a chance to. Thanks for the chance to speak, appreciate it. Rap and Don Bosley, fantastic, thank you. <laughs> our final speaker card is from Philip Papineau. Mr. Babineau, how are you tonight? How you doing this morning? I'm doing all right. Well, I want to <clears throat> share my experience with uh, you guys about the Warming Center and uh, DST and how has it helped me uh, overcome some hardships. And that is uh, the Warming Center. Um, I was uh, struggling with homelessness last year, and I was uh, uh, a uh, client of the Warming Center, and um, they just helped me just to um, analyze my situations and uh, to try to get housing and stuff like that. Um, it was a blessing to be a part of the Warming Center and uh, work, work with the wonderful people that that orchestrated this, and um, it's been a beautiful experience for me. Um, down, our downtown streets team has uh, helped me um, with employment. Uh, I've got a job offered today and um, they helped me with uh, all sorts of different things that was I found that could be hard for me, but uh, they helped me out a lot. Um, DST is, uh, we do volunteer work um, during the week and we get paid in stipends and I use that towards my rent um, on my new place that I have, um, I share an apartment with some uh, wonderful roommates, and um, it's, been, uh, it's been great. And I look forward to being a volunteer at the Warming Center this year, if, uh, if possible. And um, just to give those thanks to those uh, with the Warming Center and uh, DST. And uh, it's a beautiful experience. That's, uh, that's all I have to say. You got extra time if you want to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, really? I just want to, um, uh, some prayers to go out for my uh, lovely wife. Um, she was in a motorcycle accident um, um, last month, and mm -hmm. she's, uh, she's doing a uh, recovery right now. And just, uh, just to be there, just I need prayers out to, for her. Um, and just, you know, just try to be a, a loving father again and to get back into the life of being the basic uh basic things in life. Um, thank, thank you guys you. very much. And thank may God bless you and your families. And likewise, God bless thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's our final speaker card. I'm going to turn it over to the council for any comments, questions. Councilmember Guerrero? Yes. Thank you. 
I, uh, as I, as I asked earlier, um, looking for ways to uh, make sure that if they're participating, that we uh, provide them with access to the benefits if they're not already in, um, like CalFresh, um, there, or if the county is not able to provide the service, what I can do to make sure they do, because there's been a history where sometimes they didn't, they didn't do it, and I, I can help them navigate to um, mm -hmm. uh, work with the state, um, or work with the statewide association to access the service here in Yolo County, and then we can benefit from it in West Sacramento. Um, but I doubt that's the case in, in most of the services here that are in need, and um, employment services is the other area. Um, Workforce development um, programs, I think, are here, and uh, I'd like to make sure that um, we have, like, maybe um, a case manager who can be on site um, during this time, maybe at least maybe once or twice a week, so that they can have a connection, like a warm handoff, and um, they don't have to do any like services on site, but at least have a face and a name, you know, to go to. It, you know, once they um, transition back out into the community so they can receive support um, to be able to look for jobs. And um, the other thing is uh, the success of the Mercy Coalition is pretty significant in housing the individuals for the amount of money that we are, you know, providing. Um, it is uh, tremendously successful, even within the short period of time. And I think a lot of it is is due to you know the, all the volunteers you know and Mark you know starting off with who he is as an individual you know um, with the relationship you have um, with those that are reaching out and then tapping into all the warm hearts and love and support that everyone um, gets access to makes a huge difference in you know breaking down some of the some of the barriers that people feel about going into um, permanent housing. And I, um, you know, experienced that in visiting and will continue to visit <laughs> um, and provide some support there. And I um, think that, I think there's a lot to be said for um, something that a county employee cannot provide because they're doing it as, as a paid job, but as a volunteer. Um, and making sure that, you know, we, we acknowledge the huge benefit of the Mercy Coalition getting together and doing this, and it's not a matter of price, it's a matter of everything else they're doing that you can't put a number on it. I also want to acknowledge that the contribution you are making as a matching fund um, for the in-kind support is pretty significant. I can't, I, you know, um, I, I looked at all the line items on the funding, and uh, there's a lot of um, volunteer and a lot of in-kind contributions that are being made um, to make this happen, and this is tremendous. And uh, I'd like to continue to see moving forward how we can you know, build upon that, but also build upon providing additional support for you because you're providing a strong base to make, make this happen for our residents to be able to you know, find shelter and have success stories from the ones we heard today. I wanna make sure that happens more frequently here. Thank you. Of course. Councilmember Ledesma. Thank you. And I thought this latest, yeah, I'm, I'm supportive of this. So everybody, don't worry. Um, but, but um, you know, first of all, this thank you for folks for coming out and sharing your stories. Um, so one of the things, uh, I'll address this two ways. You thanked us for the investment into this program, which we, we approved that last year. Um, but really thank, um, your neighbors and residents in West Sacramento who passed Measure E uh, back in 2016, right? Um, because that was their, um, we knew this was an issue, right? We, and we asked voters, no one, our budget issues were um, where they were, that this was the avenue to fund this. Um, and um, so thank them because it was their commitment to this and they backed it up with our wallets and making this investment. And we're just able to get it to the, uh, to an organization like yours, which is my second point. Thank you for the work you're doing to bring this to life um, and do so in a way that makes us more comfortable directing the, the, our residents' investment. That is, um, we, we task the staff 
to um, when they provide a funding request for Measure E and uh, now Measure N, uh, and their staff report, you may see it as a Measure E analysis. That we really ask them to kind of treat it as almost a grant, so they got to make the case, and which is what's what's it worth. So uh, I know when we talked three years ago with the concept of warming centers, and it was the right ideas, it just wasn't all baked yet. But now you have a business plan, you have operations plans, you, you, you've covered it all. And that's a testament to the organization to support this. And it makes it easy for us to have this conversation and to make sure you have the resources you need from our end to make it successful. So thank you for that. Um, and then I, I, I would be remiss without thanking Mark and the work you're, you're doing um, and to our partners at Downtown Streets and to our partners in the community that volunteer every day. Um, we do this because, again, our, our, our residents made a financial investment, but um, our staff is able to execute on it every day and it works in conjunction with the volunteers to make sure uh, folks that came up tonight have the support they need. And it's just uh, part of the analysis is they give us metrics so we know outcomes. And your stories bring that to life. And that is worth more than the effort. So I appreciate you sharing your story about how uh, these warming centers helped you. I'm sorry, you're, you're blocking my person in the bag. So thank you for sharing your story as well. Um, and uh, just keep doing the good work. If there's anything, uh, I'd like to come visit uh, once you get going. So please reach, I look forward to connecting with whomever and come visit. Um, and let us know as we go um, how we're going. And then we have a meeting in December, and uh, we don't come back till late January, I think I saw in a ske schedule. Just like to keep keep us updated with the emails, whatever, how things are going, and hopefully things go, go well. Mark, thank you for all your work. Um, I know you're doing a terrific job. You represent us so well. Um, and folks here, like you saw, just a testament to the good work you and the rest of the team are doing, so thank you. Never doubt that a small group of committed, uh, thoughtful citizens could change the world because indeed that's the only thing that ever has. Um, I still remember uh, one of the mayor's State of the City addresses where he talked about the impacts and incidences of homelessness and how it transcends West Sacramento, how uh, you know we get calls about a woman who opens her door and someone's sleeping on her doorstep just trying to keep warm for the night, or a family that's trying to bike ride along the bike trail but they can't get past somebody's debris that was left there in the place. But also uh, recognizing that uh, like, like some of the, the, the personal experiences we've heard tonight. Uh, this is, nobody wants to be homeless. It's not, it's not something that they, people wake up and say like, wow, what a dream. It, it's, it's something that, it's not a group of people. It's, it, homelessness happens. And um, unfortunately, uh, you know, our, our responses uh, to this very complicated issue and very diverse community, um, it, it's, it's just such a complex, uh, a complex, um, matter to, there's no way to, to really solve it overnight. Um, there is no way. And so I was really impressed. I, I received a, a call from Carolyn Castillo Pearson a <laughs> while back, um, and she asked to meet about this idea that was coming forth from the Mercy Coalition. And, um, you know, when Carolyn calls, you, uh, you meet, because she is the first Latina uh, council member, uh, female council member here. I, I was uh, in adoration with the opportunity. But when she told me what was on the horizon, that was something I absolutely had to get behind and immediately. So I remember calling our, our uh, city manager and asking what the, the realm was, and, and it was something that was alive and well on his radar as well. So I am uh, grateful to now see it past the pilot and to be in the position where we get a chance to vote in this opportunity once again. Uh, I know that I can speak on behalf of a few of the, the, the council members here today. That w we went to go visit the, the winter warming centers um, at different locations. I was uh, hosted by uh, Pastor Don Bosley, and as well as uh, the group of Mercy Coalition members, many of whom I already knew before because of their immense uh, contributions to the West Sacramento community outside the uh, Mercy Coalition. Uh, but upon arrival, one of the most beautiful uh, experiences was having uh, just this sense of connection 
and then sense of community. People were coming alive uh, for the first time in their entire days because they were making eye contact and sharing a warm meal and a safe place to sleep for the night, a warm place. And it, there were no strangers in the room. Immediately, you, you, you're, you have a brother, you have a sister, you, you're coming together because there's a common need and someone's there to help. And, and there, was a, there was something that was said earlier, and it was it's very true. Um, there were people fighting to volunteer. It was like, no, no, I want Tuesday. And I, I thought, you know, there was, there was so much selflessness coming out of this group that it was contagious. And so I, I, um, I, I really have to say it's a very magical experience to be a part of. And so you normally um, I'm up here uh, talking about uh, another measure program, but I will say that uh, the um, Mercy Coalition was awarded the uh, the mayor's um, civic award for leader or excuse me civic leadership award for community uh, last year. Was it this year or last year? It was this year, right? And rightfully so. Um, the market success of this program uh, is, you know, unparalleled in the city's experience. And we are a young city, but we're also a city that makes things happen. And I, I really have to thank the leadership uh, who voted uh, to make that happen. And, and I am confident that we're all in support tonight. Um, not that I can speak for my, my fellow members, but by reading their, their comments. You know, I recognize a lot of those faces in the videos. And um, I, I appreciate... Uh, that at least some of them had the opportunity to uh, have the hunger for connection met by a warm smile, um, and that were, were people who felt lost could finally feel found just by walking through a set of doors at a church they'd probably never stepped foot in before. Um, and that, you know, you could just have a few hours of safety and awaken to new possibilities and the isolation ends for even a, just a, a moment of your, your day. Um, I did have one question before I, I let you go, because uh, we, haven't, we haven't ruffled you up at all, but um, <laughs> the, um, the, the warming center, it, will it be in operation like the entire week, or is it only going to be select days? It's, it's going to be five, five nights a week as okay. well. Is that excluding weekends? Is that... I think it it's through it's Saturday or Sunday, I have, Sunday Sunday through Thursday. through Thursday. There you go. Okay. Um, well, okay, fantastic. Okay, and um, last year was it seven days a week or was it five? It was, it was still five? five. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, I mean, obviously, our interest in this investment is making sure that the shelter is available to as many people as mo as much as they can. But oh, we really hey, wanted that hundred that hundred mark would be very ideal. Sure. It could be a hundred a week. Yeah. Um, because capacity has to be maxed at 20. Well, I understand that there are impediments, you know, namely like people who won't participate because of the shelters of their, their animals or belongings that, um, you know, are too plentiful for the space that is allowable. Um, so, I mean, those are, I'm sure, on the radar. I mean, obviously we only have a capacity for so much at this juncture, but perhaps it's something we can look at in the future. But I really want to say thank you. Uh, thank you for the resources that are being offered. Those are smart. Re I mean, even lice removal, um, well, not actual removal, but prevention and or um, medication. Uh, legal services is a huge one. Um, you know, just the ability for folks to navigate the community and its, its institutions. If you have a warrant out, my goodness, that's going to be prohibitive. Um, so it's, it's really good to have those cleared up. And I know we have a lot of resources in Yolo County that, you know, people can connect it to. Um, but I also appreciate that the uh, warming shelters do take safety very seriously. Uh, the fact that people will be excluded for weapons, needles, drugs, or other refuse, or alcohol and drugs, uh, those are very, they was weigh very heavily on my radar um, because, you know, obviously, you know, we want to make sure that the, the safety of all the participants is preserved. Uh, and um, again, just we truly seen progress. I really want to commend all of the, the folks here tonight. And we have a new, is it, is it president, executive director? Chair of the Mercy Coalition, Alicia uh, Gutierrez, who is you know very visible everywhere within the community. Uh, welcome aboard. Um, I look forward to seeing your leadership, and um, again to the volunteers who operate with this can-do attitude. That's really reflective of the folks in West Sacramento. If there's any place to do it, it's this city, 
It's this city. We love our city. And the thing is, we all have different ways to achieve what we all really want. But, you know, it's all, we're all doing a different dance. We all want the same thing, just a different dance, right? But I really appreciate that, you know, when it comes down to humanitarian efforts to, to make sure people are safe and warm and sheltered during the worst months of the year, that you guys are all making it happen. So I'm fully in support of this item. And if there are no other comments or questions, I will entertain a motion. Move to approve. A motion is made uh, to by Councilmember Guerrero. Um, I'm, I'm reticent to the second only because we haven't given Abraham a really bad time up here on his first uh, presentation. Uh, so, so uh, but I will to the, I'll let it go this time. <laughs> Next right. time we have to sing your college fight song or something. <laughs> um, but I'll second. An agree second by uh, Councilmember Ledesma. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And any opposed? The motion carries. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At this juncture, we're going to move to our final items, uh, council calendar. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and council members. Um, a couple of items that are coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, on Sunday, it's not on your um, calendar in your packet, but on San Sunday, um, November 10th, we're going to have the city sponsor. Is the city is co-sponsoring the Veterans Day Parade, and that's at 1 o'clock, and that's starting at the Westmore Oaks Elementary School. Um, the YCT board meeting, it's noted in the calendar, is canceled on no, um, Monday, November 11th because it's uh, Veterans Day. And that meeting was moved to, as my understanding, it was moved to um, November 18th, so the following Monday. Um, also, uh, an item that is not on the calendar at this point is November, <coughs> November 14th um, is a Thursday, and that's going to be the Valley Clean Energy board meeting, and that's at the Woodland Council Chambers, and that starts at 530. And then finally... On the 15th, um, next Friday, we're going to have the change of command ceremony for um, the fire chief, and that's at Station 45, and it starts at 5.30. Thank you. Uh, city manager? Uh, just one other note on the calendar. We are canceling the November 20th meeting. I know you're all aware of that, but just for the members of the public who aren't here anymore. Uh, this is also uh, Chief Heilman's last council meeting. Um, we will have the change of command ceremony next week. Hopefully, uh, you all be able to attend. But I uh, wanted to take one last opportunity in front of all the public to thank <laughs> yeah. the chief for uh, all of his service to the city. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And I second that. I mean, I know we'll have an opportunity to speak to you directly, Chief. Uh, your, your service and commitment to the city is, and I'll use it again, unparalleled. Thank you so much, sir, for your service. And we look forward to your ceremony. Well. The outgoing ceremony. But I think well, I'm not looking forward to it. Both I, I want the looking celebration. We're going to lose you, lose but again, we, right? we, I'm really <clears throat> glad for you know what you've done um, in the succession and um, looking. You know, um, our future chief Benz is going to do an excellent job, and that's thanks to your leadership, your guidance, your mentorship, and to those all of those with under your command. You've done a great job. You've really groomed. Um, uh, some incredible um, firefighters to, you know, go up the rank and, and not only serve us but others in different parts. Um, so I appreciate everything you've done, Chief. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate everything you've done. We'll see you next Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, but just want to say thank you for everything you're doing. And and this is uh, about the time you have to come up and do your college fight song, <laughs> your last meeting. <laughs> no? Okay. I tried. No raps or anything. <laughs> All right. Uh, city attorney? Okay. Uh, any staff direction from city council members? And future agenda items requested by council? All right. With that, uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Do it. To adjourn. Motion made a by second. council member Guerrero and seconded by council member Ledesma. All in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, meetings adjourned. <laughs>